Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Rich Drucknowitz. Rich is the Senior Director of Engineering and Quality at 4Moms. Rich, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming on. I've been wanting to do this for a while. So. Same here. Yeah, I appreciate you being a listener, by the way. Yep. Uh, you are able to uh, reference a bunch of episodes and we're warming up to this, so that made me really happy to hear someone listen to these things. LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn was pushing them to me, and, you know, knew some nice. people on there and started listening to them, and now actually have them on my podcast feed. Sweet. I'm, I'm really glad you like it. Yeah, that's, it's that's why we do it. <laughs> so. It's a small world in Pittsburgh, so it's actually a good good chunk of people I've either worked with before or met before, so it's been awesome. interesting. Yeah, you mentioned Eli and, and Kevin in particular, yep. both both great guys, and you know, it's always been good to me. So, Kevin, I feel like is uh, he almost like kind of feels like um, like a nerdy uncle or something. Like like, have you been to his place? Yeah, yeah. So he's probably showed you all of his like antique woodworking tools, and yep. like he's he's awesome. I, I think that guy. He's is also great. like just the like jack of all trades, but then if, he also like knows everyone too. So it's like you'll casually mention this like. Thing you read about and you'd be like oh yeah i know that guy that's so and so that's doing it and i'll be like wow okay cool kevin like he's just like one degree of kevin Dowling. i brought him into torah facility i was at and um he uh started just casually talking about like hanging out with dean came the weekend before <laughs> it's literally the example i was going to talk about he was like oh yeah you know dean came in likes to fly his helicopter in and he offered me a ride or something one time i was like whoa okay i think they're like pretty good buddies at this point yeah it seems like they they know each other like the way Kevin talks about it, it's like he 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 definitely knows the dude. <laughs> definitely. So, did you do uh, Did you do first robotics like growing up? Speaking of I did not. Know? I um, my high school was not very big on tech. In fact, I actually tried to create a technology robotics club in high school, and it just kind of fell flat. Um, Brutal. Yeah, I was. I didn't even know about first. I didn't. I didn't really discover robotics until like late in middle school. I actually stumbled upon. Um, it was like a robotics called Beam Robotics. Oh, I loved Beam. Milk Tilden. Mark yeah, Tilden. yeah, that's that's what I basically grew up on. It was like Mark Tilden and what was uh, it? Bug Bots. What the hell was this book called? Um, there was Junk Bots. Bug. Yeah, they're like, like uh, Walkmen because a lot of them were made. Yeah, from, like, cannibalized hard drives. Exactly, cannibalized yeah, like hard floppy drives, disks, Walkmen, yeah. disc cassette players when they were a thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was that. That was the stuff I learned about. That was my start too. My my first robot when I, I was twelve was a Beam robot. Nice in middle school also. Yeah, I had like a little cigar box of them, uh, little a solar awesome. powered and battery powered ones. And uh, for CMU, we actually had to do an interview, so I was just like, "Hey, I make robots," and I like kind of opened it up and just like played with the robots. And You're like, in. Yeah, basically, <laughs> that's what it felt like. They're just like, "Oh, tell me what they do," and I was like, "Oh, it works this way. This sensor, and this is how that operates." And they're like. Okay, you're in. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. We found good. another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, actually, one of the things that influenced me was, um, so in my element, I went to Winchester Thurston down mm -hmm. the street from CMU, yeah. and uh, it's just I think everyone at CMU is just a hoity-toity school that no one really knows anything about. Which it kind of is, I mean, to be honest. <laughs> but I, I had uh, some coworkers whose kids were there. We nice. went there and they would describe the same thing. But like, yes. oh, it all it all pays off in the end. My kids won't be able to afford to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> basically, um, it uh, the so there was a guy that was like an IT guy. I can't remember what exactly his title was, mm -hmm. but I mean, he, he maintained the school's computers and. He, uh, I think, was like the, the staff sponsor for a student organization. Like it was like a computer club or a tech club or something. Mm -hmm. And I think we were like in fifth or sixth grade, and we started walking to CMU to check out the Mobot mm -hmm. competition. And so that was kind of one of my entry points in early yes. on, where I was just like, "This is awesome! Like I, I want to be like these guys." You know? Yeah. The only place I heard about CMU was like in middle school, high school. I used to watch all the like robot specials on Discovery Channel. Nice. They always talked about like, oh, you know, this robot is learning about like how you know, using human learning, human computer interaction to, to learn about shapes and emotions. It was a lot of like Rodney Brooks and Hans Marvick and um, was Brooks at CMU at one point? Uh, they were covering like all robotics Got at the time. Nice. So they, they were go. They, it was mostly MIT, but then like more and more of these shows I watch, I start to see a lot more CMU people. You know, Red Whitaker would pop up. Um, just a whole bunch of people and I would just be like wow I think he knows Bugs Aldrin somehow <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> <laughs> but like I just kept seeing CMU 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 on these Discovery Channel things and then like I was like oh well I gotta go there and um, basically it was like my reach school applying and you know I got in that's the interview I'm sure definitely helped 
That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, I just like gravitated to all things robotics when I got there because I really started mechanical engineering. Like I really was like building things, making things, but then I learned about like software and electronics and how they can create this whole like next level of like interaction and making things work that uh, just pure mechanics couldn't do. So I guess what were some of your first like software based projects that you worked on? Uh, I, the, literally the first thing I bought was a basic stamp. Nice, same. So yeah, I just- High school shop teacher gave me one. Yep, that's <laughs> basically what it was. Like I had a um, uh, technology class in high school, but like I said, like high school technology wasn't like really a big thing. So like they had a whole closet that had like all the electronic components, resistors, like everything. And he was just like, no one else is gonna use it. Go go have free range. No, that was pretty much it. He yeah. was like, we got these. Uh, I know you'll do something with it. Just take one. Exactly. Like <laughs> there's other kids like who had no interest in stuff, and they're like built, burning like steel wool and stuff. And I'm in the back like <laughs> taking a circuit board, a, a piece of copper, and like using a sharpie to yep. run yep. traces and, and burn it in the acid, <laughs> and like making a circuit board. And it was it was great. Like and then he gave me robot kits, and then told me about basic stamp, and just started making like platforms and stuff. That's awesome. What was the first thing you did with the basic stamp? Uh, I built just a little like diff drive platform. So a caster in front, two Service? giant wheels, servo <laughs> awesome. wheels. That I had to take the servos, modify them for you know full rotation, and then just put the basic stamp on, and it would just go forward, turn left, right. So I think mine was it was either an L two nine eight or something similar to mm -hmm. an L two nine eight. I think it had like a black heat sink on the on the drives, and then. It was these little gear motors off like robotstore.com and like a little track system from Tamiya, I think. That was that was the place so, I used to hit up all the time. Oh, I met the guy that started it when I was at SpaceX as an intern. Really? So it was it was this guy um, whose job at SpaceX was making the building look cool, <laughs> and he was like just you know putting like LEDs behind stuff and and you know figuring out framing and colors and you know there's like a guy like that in a few different places. Right. And he was the guy. He was that guy for SpaceX. And I was like, how'd you get into that? And I was asking people weird penetrating questions even then. And he was like, oh, I started this company called Robot Store. And I saw, I'm like, you started Robot Store? Can I give you a hug? <laughs> this guy looks so weirded out. Like this, I went up to him as like, you know, a 20 something year old kid. I was like, ah. Yeah, <laughs> like, made my childhood. I was gonna say, yeah, same here. It was Robot <laughs> Store, Solar Botics, and DigiKey. Solar Botics was good. That was Tilden's, right? Uh, it was, um, what's his name, Dave. Dave something, Dave Hiwinky or something. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah for some reason, I, I guess because it was beam heavy, I just affiliated yeah. my head, but you're right. I think, I think he helped out a lot with it, like developing the kits or working with them on the kits and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, those are the top three, like I always ordered stuff from. Well, what was the last one again? DigiKey. Digi DigiKey, yeah. of course. Yeah, because I learned like, oh, I can order from Solibotics or I can just go to DigiKey and get like a bunch of stuff. I wasn't that smart when I was getting started. Like, I don't think I figured it out of a DigiKey until I was in college. I always had trouble hitting the like, was it $25 minimum or something they had at the time? But, but <laughs> nice. It was good. Now I feel overprivileged. <laughs> <laughs> Begging my parents to buy me stuff from Robot Store. <laughs> That's always how I had to like, kind of like market it and be like, well, you know, I'm learning about this. It's all for education. I can build these robots. And I do remember like, I think at one point I got like 20 bucks a week in allowance or something. Mm -hmm. And I remember like saving up for like five weeks and then blowing it all at American Science and Surplus, and just um, oh, I was like, I don't need I money. That. That, was, wow. that was my that was my logic in my head. I was like, I don't need money. I, I want these random. <laughs> man, you were just like hitting like everything. I remember, I remember getting those catalogs and like circling like I. Oh man, they had like a whole bunch of like beakers and like test tubes. Yeah. I'm, like I don't need these, but that's so cool. I want these. Would you come stuff. up with projects based on the stuff you found in the catalogs? Because. That's what I would do. <laughs> that's, and that, that's like my number one rule even to this day is like I don't buy tools or parts unless I have a project for it. Otherwise, Smart. it would just become like a complete hoarder. And even to yeah. this day, I still have a bunch of like parts and stuff. I actually, I, I just talked to a guy this morning um, who uh, he did like a boot camp um, and he was, he was a lawyer who helped me out on something like five years ago, I want to say. And um, when he was like junior at a law firm and like it was, it was a weird thing and like not that many people took an interest but this guy, um, a long story, I, I mean I can get into it but you know, just to keep it relevant for now. This guy, you know, was like, it took the time to talk to me and like sort of explain our position and mm -hmm. go through all these different things. And so he reached out, I had no idea who he was but he was like, I want to learn about robot arms. I'm like, oh, the guy wants to learn about robot arms. So yeah, I, I think like two weeks ago we booked it, you know, and I, you know, 7 a.m. You know, just jumped on a Zoom with him. You know, and nice. yeah, it was kind of fun. And um, so, you know, I'm like, "What's your budget?" You know, and he says like 200 dollars. So I'm like, well, that rules out ABBs. You yeah. know, like <laughs> last season robot program I was going to tell you about. You know, so, 
<laughs> so, I mean, it basically it relegates you to hobby servos and, you know, 3D printed components or yeah. maybe like a Lynx Motion kit or something. Yeah. And so I um, showed him Lynx Motion. I um, showed him like some kits on Amazon. And then I was like, you know, I've got all these hobby servos that I'm never going to use. Like, I, I don't really build stuff at this level anymore. But, you know, it's like I, it's where I got started. And, you know, it's still interesting to me. And never going to use it. So I, like, I had like 30 of them in a drawer, mostly CMU trash picks when mm -hmm. I was a student. And I'm just like, I'm just, I haven't done it yet, but I'm just going to throw them all in a, you know, flat rate box and send them to the guy with a couple of Arduinos. And it's basically what I have brick. too. It's yeah. like, there's a shelf in my garage that's just like boxes of like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and servos and LEDs. And it's like, probably should just donate to Senior Robotics Club. Yeah, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Yeah, I have two boys now. One is just over three and it's oh, like, oh, oh maybe i'll hold on to it and justify keeping it for a little longer in case he starts you know, wants to become his shop probably yeah yeah that'll yeah. be cool i mean that's i feel like i mean the way you're describing your childhood sounds like a lot like mine so i feel like you know your kid probably if he takes a similar line would be into that kind of stuff and he is interested into like i took like you're doing just program like simple lights when you like hit a button and stuff and he was starting to gravitate towards it because like oh I do this and this thing happens and I was like well there you go it's engineering like yeah. you know it's the beginning that's it yeah, so uh, we'll see we'll see in a few well, years the people that do that from an early age I feel like really stand out in the field because yeah I mean I know the hobby experience doesn't really count like in a professional con but mm -hmm. it does give you like decades of perspective and you know like the ability to do the process and yeah it's it's know, still the yeah. process regardless of what you're doing mm -hmm. it's like oh I'm doing this with a ten twenty dollar servo and a you know, two dollar microcontroller but then like career wise it's basically the same thing i have this multi thousand dollar yep. microcontroller and multi thousand dollar motors that i hope i don't burn out um, <laughs> like, but it's the same but if you process. do you've got two more order to spares because this is an important project in the time exactly. that can suffer yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. yep magic smoke yep <laughs> magic smoke that was a big term did you ever do battle bots I did not, but uh, when I was at Robotics Club, one of the teams there um, did BattleBots, and he's actually still involved. He's actually on the TV show currently. Doing oh, that's it. cool. Yeah. What, did what guy? Uh, Victor Soto. He's. Uh, no, I've well, heard the name though. I feel the like the robot was called Revenant, but I, I forgot they rebranded themselves. But now he's like a character in the, the reality show that BattleBots has become. There's a BattleBots reality. Oh yeah. yeah. Well yeah, they, they showed I, the show. I had a beer with Ray Billings a little bit. The guy that won like season two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was saying they just painted him as a villain. Like, actually, I'll be, I'll have to confess, I don't watch the show really anymore because it's just, like you said, it's kind of gotten... Yeah, when I when I saw Victor on it, I watched a couple episodes, and I was like, this is not Victor's show. Yeah, it was totally... one of my buddies from grad school's on it, and I checked her out just to, you know, kind of, you know... Yeah. Yeah, just support a friend, you know, but it was like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still fun. Like, I still watch the battles, but, like, all the, like... The, the announcers are so hokey. Like, I, some of the shit they say, it's like, where yeah. do you... I just what? skip through them now. It's, yeah, like, exactly. A true American patriot worked on, you know, it's like, really? You know, how do you know that? You know, those things are terrifying. The, um, yeah. the Revenant robot they had at the time was this, like, three or four foot diameter conical dome that had these, like, it looked like some sort of Klingon bathless, like, spike <laughs> thing that was, like, this long, that tall, and it was on the outside. It would spin up to, I think it was, like, 3,000 RPM. Holy moly. And when they were testing it, they were throwing, like, old, like, CRTs and yeah, that's they how found you do dumpster it. diving around CMU. They would yeah. just throw it out there and they would drive into it and it would just obliterate it. it was <laughs> terrifying. Is it one of those titanium ones? Where yeah, like, it was a titanium oh, dome. And, those uh, things get so expensive. There was a video, they were doing a battle and um, it, they, they drove into a corner, got hit by a hammer, it tilted it, it bit the ground, took a chunk out of the floor, <laughs> went up in the air and bounced off three of the four walls of the containment room and just took chunks out of everything. Is that one of those things where that's the reason that wall is thicker now? That's why the wall is so thick and <laughs> yeah. uh, I think they got uh, they got to keep the chunk of floor they took out because even the floor is some like ridiculously heavy material. And oh, that's they awesome. Get, like, a two inch divot out of it. That's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, those things are really cool, terrifying, really expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you know how much they spent on it? Uh, so I think they, they got grants and stuff, but most of the money had to come from sponsorships because CMU yeah, grants sense. weren't enough, but it, it was probably in order of tens of thousands of dollars, yeah, like 10 sense. or 20 or something like that. I feel like the most expensive one I heard about was like 200 grand and it was like a CNC like billet dome or something. Yeah. yeah. Some of them get crazy it's and like, insane. it was fun cause it was actually the first time I got to see people working in titanium and that stuff's crazy. Like they had like, 
they were trying to bend some titanium bands and like you just cannot cold work that like <laughs> Victor was like using the um, C clamp and I was just like hitting it with a torch and he's just like hammering it and we're just That's like amazing. bending on it and then he lets go of the C clamp and the thing just flips back as if like <laughs> you never even touched it. it I put it through one of the um, I, I had this 16th inch aircraft titanium from mm-hmm. a Russian and it was some weird alloy. It was meant to be harder than grade five, but not weldable. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was from Russian aircraft, like wing exteriors, I think. And I think one of the BattleBot teams had got it from like a scrapyard. And it was the guys that made like that yellow, like Bumblebee one from the new uh, season. Yep. I don't remember, Wendy Dalton, I think I bought it off of. Mm-hmm. And um, she, had, she gave me a good price. Very good, very nice. <laughs> it's special for me, you know. And, <laughs> So I still have some of that in the shop. It's it's interesting material, but I put it through because uh, my buddy and I was trying to make low low cost bike packing material for like a trip to South America, mm-hmm. and so I, I sold him a bunch just to do that with. And um, we were working at the Field Robotics Center, and I think we put it in the bandsaw, we belt sanded the corners, and that all worked somehow and didn't break any bandsaw blades. But then I think um, we put it through the metal brake, and it got to the end, and I still have a bent piece like on my coffee table mm-hmm. where it's maybe like. I don't know, like I would say like uh, an eight inch dam, uh, eight inch radius, mm-hmm. uh, but like maybe like a you know four inch segment of it. And um, it shot up in the air, like from the springing of it coming out of the brake, like I feel like 20 feet. <laughs> yeah, but land, like zing. super springy stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. So I don't have a whole lot of titanium working experience. But no, that's, that's, your story. that's the only experience that. I had. Numerally, mm-hmm. it's aluminum, steel, and plastic. These yeah, days. yeah. yeah. Decent amount of aluminum, decent amount of steel, uh, decent amount of machining plastic. I have like no injection molding experience, so I'd be curious to hear about that from you. Yeah, no short. I know you of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Thorne came on that. Uh, well, you were on that panel too. Yep. Yeah, that's where I invited you to do this. Yep. An idiot. But he was like talking up injection molding, so I'm like, okay, it's clear this guy knows about that. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. Four moms was definitely my first experience with injection molding. It's definitely really awesome process there is a lot that can go wrong for very small changes there's little things like the channels that the plastic runs through if the diameter of that is even off by like a 16th of an inch you can like when you're molding multiple parts in a mold like you can have a whole bunch of them just come out like crap brutal yeah so do you have to drill it out at that point yeah usually what they'll do is they'll uh, either mill it out or burn it out with the that makes sense but um little things like that but once you get it dialed in, it's a really great process for scale. Is but it always trial and error to make a mold work correctly? There's a lot, a lot of science into it, um, but there is a point where I definitely say there's art. I'm sure there's people out there who disagree that everything can be figured out through the science. But so um, you get in the field, though. I mean, like a lot of times those models fall apart. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely people out there that will get a part out. It'll be like warped, and then they'll like turn to the the controller on the the press and like tell them to like dial this, change this, and then part comes out beautifully they that's just, awesome. they just know like they're just magic that's amazing <laughs> yeah but yeah i think injection mold's really really awesome um what's some of the stuff that i mean obviously like cheap parts quickly but i guess what's some of the stuff that you realize when you start injection molding this is getting out of my knowledge base to be honest but I'm, yeah I'm i mean the big thing is yeah it's it gives you a lot of parts very inexpensively um so before four moms, I came from an industrial realm, so I had like no real concept of like injection molding or anything. So probably the first like five years of my career, four moms was just learning about injection molding and the process and um, things that does well and doesn't do well. Um, you know, probably eighty percent of the parts in our products are all injection molded. Nice. And, like that goes down to like you might have like washers that are like the size of a penny, and then we have parts that are. I'm trying to think the biggest stuff we made were like covers and like body housings that are probably like 24 inch cube. So I'm picturing like a Mamaru or something yeah, like that? Yeah, like a Mamaru, like the top cover, the base bottom of the Mamaru, those are you know, projected areas probably roughly 24 by 24 and then a depth of about an inch or two. So one thing that like comes to my mind is like, why would you make a custom washer? Because I feel like that's like thing number one to buy at the scales I'm used to working in. I, I, yeah, you know, not making thing, a million of a thing, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, if we can buy, so a lot of fasteners we buy because they're just ready available. Like a standard washer, we probably just buy it if we can. But if we need a specific material, or we need like maybe it's not a washer, it needs to be like a, a flanged oh, or something exactly. like that. We'll probably just mold it because a lot of times it's easier to just get make the tool and 
make the parts than it is to like try to find someone who's making that and is willing. Well, to sell. now your whole supply chain is at their mercy too. So right if they now you have control, issue. you can make it, which you know cuts both ways. Like now it's your problem if that part comes <laughs> out. Granted, if someone ships you something that is not correct, sometimes it's still your problem, but you know you still have to. Uh, there's, there's challenges. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But, that's um, a lot of sense. I had somebody ship some parts to me the other day that were the wrong alloy. So, mm -hmm. and I, I like, you know, you always question your own sanity. So I like went back through the prints. I'm like, did our engineers specify? <laughs> like, yeah. One in 2024, it was 6061. It was a really, luckily, like low stakes part. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just like did some tests. I'm like, these are 6061. I called the guy up. He's like, what alloy are these? 6061. Like, the print says 2024. Like, how did that happen? Oh. <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's the same thing in plastic too. Like, it's you get these parts, and you're like, "Huh, it's not performing the spec." And you try to figure out, like, you know, you know, did they use the right grade of material? So, like, did they use polypro instead of ABS or something else? Yeah, um, makes sense. But then, even within that, it's like, what version of polypro did they use? It's, it's, How do you test for that typically? So it's easy easier to test the difference between like a polypro and like an ABS. An ABS, you can like. There's like a whole flow diagram you can get like online and oh, other cool. schools have, but like ABS, you can like light it and if it burns with like a black flame, it's definitely going to be ABS. Oh, but cool. like if you burn um, polypro, it should be pretty clear uh, when it burns. But then if you burn it and it creates a formaldehyde smell, that actually might be POM. Interesting. So there's like a whole decision tree. I'm guessing it smells like formaldehyde because it is formaldehyde. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> you burn it, it is formaldehyde. So you don't want to like burn it for a long time, but yeah. like if you burn it and it should be POM, you smell formaldehyde, you know it's good. Um, so that at least gets you like in the family of resin, but like knowing the specific grade, it's actually pretty tough unless there's like some performance aspect that you're really looking for. So like interesting. If it's like an abrasive aspect that you can like test for, then you can tell if they use the right version of the polypro or they use the wrong version. Yeah. Is there ever a case where like you got something functionally identical? Well, I guess you wouldn't know. I'm like wondering like like these aren't what we asked for, but they work in this in this context. You're just like, let's put them on. I mean, and sometimes we do that. Like yeah. sometimes like if, unless we know something has a very specific performance requirement, we'll just yeah. be like, all right, just shoot like whatever the generic material is, and we'll go with that. But then we find through testing, oh wow, this thing like wore down, so we'll have to get like a special grade of that resin, and then they'll reshoot it in that or. Um, nice thing with plastic, you can actually do like custom compounding, like you can put oh, cool. fillers and stuff in there, so you can put talc and glass and things like that. That's it. So I've, I've messed around a little bit with the glass stuff with uh, resins, not not pellets, but it's it's interesting some of the stuff you can do. Actually, in BattleBots, so hmm. okay. one of my buddies made these um, like. 3D printed, um, it was basically like the mold you pour concrete into mm -hmm. in a foundation, and then you would pour, um, I think it was polyurethane mm -hmm. with like Kevlar into that. Whoa. And so, yeah, it was sweet. <laughs> it actually yielded like a pretty pretty good chassis. Nice. And you make the whole chassis that way, and then you just have the 3D printed scaffolding as, as part of it. Nice. You know? so it was cool. Kind of a, yeah, it was interesting. It was a cool approach. Huh. So we, we were messing around with that for BattleBots for a little bit, and then. I think it actually got used in work a bit too. I can't remember what projects in particular, but I think I, think I brought that to the office <laughs> on a couple of occasions. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I can say I mess with concrete outside of like home projects. But yeah. Well, this wasn't concrete, but I mean, again, the, the scaffolding kind of reminds me because it was like a oh. shell oh, that see. you filled in with, with urethane. Nice. And then it, it you know, it's kind of looked like a concrete mold. That's cool. Yeah, there's. You can do, um, what is it, like insert molding is something we also commonly do. So oh, you'll, cool. like, you'll mold something, or you might want to like have an embedded washer. So you'll like put that in the mold, and then they'll put it in the press, and then they'll shoot plastic around so it's like capped it. In the, is that just to basically like have a surface that doesn't wear as much as the rest of it? Yeah, so like you need the strength of something metal, but yeah. like plastic can't get you anywhere near there. What you can do is create like features in that metal part so that when the plastic comes in, it like grabs that part and That's awesome. it. And then the other stuff we can do that we've done is a, just like a two shot. So if you want something that's a clear and opaque plastic, usually like um, UIs and uh, other products will have that where you'll have like clear in certain areas, but then you want a dark, opaque, or white. You can um, shoot this part and um, you either can do that as an insert where you take out that part and you put it in another tool and then they mold that dark plastic around it. Or oh, cool. you can do a uh, rotary tool, uh, which is really cool to watch. It's a specialized press, but it's basically, it's a tool that has two halves, and what they do is they shoot the clear, and then the tool opens up, 
rotates so that the clear part is on the other side. They close oh. it, and then they shoot the plastic over it, and then it opens up. That drops out, and then rotates, and you can just that's keep really cool. Out these. Watching yeah. the whole injection mold process is really really cool. Yeah, no, that that sounds and like it's one of those things I've been wanting to learn about, but it's just I, I usually live in early stage new product development, so right. I haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, it's definitely, and that was probably the biggest change I had uh, going from industrial to, um, like, consumer products. It's, it's definitely a space I always wanted to explore, and it's just, yeah, I'm used to, like, okay, let's just hog out this giant 5,000 block of, uh, $5,000 block of aluminum and put in whatever features we need. And yep, that's what I'm used now to. Now I'm in the world of, like, well, we 3D print it, test it, and then we send it off so they can go make a ten hundred thousand dollar block of steel that molds it. Yep, that's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I feel like that unlocks economies. I mean, you well, obviously it unlocks economies of scale you'd never hit without it. I mean, yeah. So yeah, but I mean, past life economies like the scales we're talking about is like dozens of robots. I think. What did you? What were you doing? I was working at Red Zone Robotics. Oh, cool! I did first, not know that. First job out of college was Red Zone Robotics. So. I feel like you've told me that, or I've heard that in passing, and for some reason I just didn't have it connected right now during this interview yeah, a, lot of, a lot of sewage exposure and fun so what is it jason Mizgorski said it's a shit job but i love it yeah pretty much exactly yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was a lot of fun for sure yeah. disgusting it many many times but the last time i was in there i, I will never forget the smell because <laughs> they were yeah, bringing back we one were, of the giant ones when we were there when i was there we were in the chocolate the factory in like lawrenceville oh wait I, you guys were in the edward mark factory yeah the one across from like the ice house in lawrenceville like 43rd Street? We're like right behind it. There's a different chocolate factory in 39th Street that I'm thinking of. Uh, no, 38th, sorry. Okay, no, this is, yeah, this is, I think it's like 43rd. It's like right behind the back side There's of it. a lot of chocolate in Pittsburgh back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've never, it's that's not a Sarah's. The Form Logic's based out of the old Edward Mark Brands facility, which is 55 38th Street. Huh. And yeah, it's, it's, it's probably was like a booming chocolate industry here at one yeah, point. Yeah, never heard of that. That's, Do, yeah. Do you know when they were when they were like active as a chocolate factory just to try to back that? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think these guys were doing it in the early two thousands. Just just for reference. Uh, yeah, Rizzo moved to that building in two thousand eight or nine. So that kind of ticks. Like maybe maybe there was like a brief lived chocolate industry. Maybe yeah. I mean we're speculating. We don't know. It. Send all hate mail to yeah. podcast. The only chocolate, chocolate industry I know is like Sarah, Sarah's chocolate in Pittsburgh. I see it all the gift shop in the airport. And that's cool. I'm a Willy Wonka man myself. <laughs> Snozberries taste like Snozberries. <laughs> I like to think of myself as a, a younger Augustus, an older Augustus Gloop. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, Red, Red Zone was interesting just because, yeah, it was the first time I had, like, like full-time employment as, like, industrial robotics, so. That's cool. But, yeah. We were developing a small diameter uh, autonomous pipe inspection robot. It's still around. I think they still Yeah, use. I think I saw that would be the Solo. Solo, yep. Yep. The, yeah. Those are cool. Yeah, it was me and a team of three other guys. Um, basically from the beginning. I think when I joined they they were just they just had like a wheel platform they were putting in there, uh, into the sewer literally. They were back at Homestead and like I joined and they're just like, Oh yeah, we're gonna go deploy this robot and like walked outside, popped the manhole and just like shoved it in there. That's and awesome. Drive it. <laughs> And it's kind of how it works in the beginning. It really is. It really is. Just, like, you get it out there, and then you find yeah. all these like horror things down there. And like we iterated it on the product probably over three or four years, and went from this thing that was tethered that we drove to this like really awesome like autonomous platform that you can like you drop down there, you like hook onto the manhole, you put this like little bar in so it has an anchor point, and take a laptop, hit go, and it goes down the sewer and picks pictures and videos that get stitched together later. That's awesome. But, yeah. Yeah, we spend a lot of time in um, doing just a lot of field testing. Yeah. It's probably one of the reasons why I'm like such a big proponent of like get stuff in the field as often as possible because Amen to that. You'll like you can't even predict the stuff you will find. Like you just gotta get the stuff out there, get the product out there, you'll learn from it and evolve it from there. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. How do you how do you do that with like a large scale consumer product? Because I feel like you can't just do like a full scale release. Do you have like an alpha beta program? Yeah, so usually we'll go through a couple iterations before we get to tooling. Um, so a lot of 3D print, a lot of, um, in some cases we'll machine stuff, but more often 3D print, we'll try to make as many prototypes as we can uh, with materials as close to the real thing, try to prove out the product, and then uh, if we're good and happy with it, we'll commit to tooling, and then after tooling, you're 
basically try to flesh out the variations for mass production, but you're yeah. trying to really commit yourself to the design of a product, what it's going to be and everything before you get to tooling, because when you get to tooling, you're so to get expensive. To, yeah, a whole lot of money. Yeah. Have you ever been in a situation where you've committed to tooling and then had to make new tooling? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, it's enough. actually something you budget for. You try not to, mm -hmm. um, and you even try, like even now we're more proactive in trying to design a tool to be able to be modified oh, later. Sweet. So like, We'll try to be like, all right, you know, this area we'll design in such a way so that like, if it turns out these screws don't hold, we need to add snaps. We'll have room for lifters that can add nice. like, undercut and stuff like that. So that's awesome. Um, you know, we also make sure like make sure there's no water lines here, so that way if we need to put something in, we don't have to, like break a water line and that gets expensive. What's a water line? So that's what actually cools the, the plastic. So uh, throughout the big block of steel that makes the tool, there's zigzagging channels. Oh, cool. Uh, that they pump water through to basically cool. So the actual the actual molding process is like really, really fast and the rest of it is just sitting there cooling. So it's interesting. Um, I took this really great class in Erie, Pennsylvania, by the I think it's the Beaumont Institute. Um, for those that don't know, Erie PA is like a really big um, uh, injection molding classes up there. And uh, I went up there and like they actually had like a clear cool. tool, a video of a clear tool someone made, so you can actually watch the process and it's just That's like awesome. boom, like the plastic just gets shot in, it's in there, it's done, and then the rest of the time it's just running water through the, the, the tool to cool everything so the part solidifies. To so you're not running pressure. water when you shoot the plastic in because you want it to go you might you, you might still be, but um, yeah. you're, you're the actual like shooting the plastic in there, I mean, it's very dependent on the size of the part, but usually it's only within like less than a second. Oh, okay. So, so even if it's kind of cool edges, it's going in so fast. It's, it's going in so it. fast and then, but like the actual cycle time, the time it takes to like run through one entire part can be, I mean, we have some parts that are 60, 70, uh, 100 seconds of cycle time, but like that's all just cooling. Yeah, it makes just sense. Just shot this liquid plastic, and you're just letting the water churn through and cool everything down. It's interesting. You don't want the part to come out and come out hot, and then it just kind of goopy gets. Well, it's not even goopy. It'll just like cool. It'll always pull towards where the um, the most material is. So like, oh, interesting. You think if you have a part and it's got a lot of ribbing on the inside. If you take it out too early and it's too hot, it'll actually start to taco up on. So you. the ribs contract. Yeah, because uh, yeah. yeah, basically all that heat is trapped in all that extra material, and it, everything will just start pulling towards the hottest point. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's a lot of stuff. That's like that's what you're trying to really focus on at the post tool. Like after you've made tooling, you're focusing on those issues, like getting your cooling times right, what temperature you cool at, um, just trying to make it so that like the part that comes out is exactly what you basically three D printed and. Came up with. So this is going to sound really naive, but yeah. like, I mean, I, I guess I've made cookies before and I always spray the sheet down with like, you know, some kind of lubricant. Do you have to do that when you're injection molding? No, and actually a really good manufacturer tool does not need any kind of like mold release. Oh, cool. Some crappy tools I've seen, they'll, they'll do that, but um, you actually want, you want the part to actually stick on one side of the tool because these two metal pieces come together. Um, one side will usually be polished, and, but the other side, which has all the ejector pins, the thing that pushes it out, uh, you want it to stick to that side because it opens and separates, and then those pins push the part. Do you out. just get that by like having a lesser machine toler uh, surface finish, or uh, you can do it? You can control it by surface finish. Uh, it's usually um, usually more like surface area. Usually the side has the ejector pins has like all the ribs. They call that traditionally the, the B surface, the underside B surface. surface, and then the cool. A surface is the stuff that everyone sees. That's, that's like interesting. Stuff. And then the B surface is where you want the part to usually stick to. Yeah. Um, but like a really good part that's designed has good drafts, so making sure you don't have any undercuts, um, it'll stick to that side and it should just pop off real nice. That's awesome. But it doesn't always go that way. Yeah. It, usually when you're in those early rounds of engineering prototyping, um, after the tool's made, you're figuring out like, oh, you know, when they ejected, the part like stuck up here, but not down here. So it like came out kinked because the pin pushed this side, but the side stuck. That's and, interesting. Uh, you're just doing like a whole bunch of like, figuring out how to get the tool to produce the right part. So it's just post-machining, I would think, a lot of the time, or changing control settings or both? Yeah, sometimes I'll have to um, either tweak the, the pin pattern. It's kind of the worst case scenario, but sometimes it's little things that, yeah, like a pin is not pushing the correct um, the correct amount, so maybe it's like jamming in the tool, something like that. Or yeah. Some cases, what they'll actually do is they'll add little ribs and stuff in the tool to if it's slipping somewhere and sticking more in another place, they'll actually um, add ribs, so it'll actually like stick evenly. Oh, cool! But a lot of this is adding ribs. Well, I guess you would just mill out because it's negative space. Yeah, right? depending on the design, yeah. yeah, they can just do like a quick channel and just run through an end mill. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's usually you don't even get to that point because a lot of times we'll do like simulations, things like mold flow, where they're actually like doing a simulated injection mold. 
Um, so they'll, they'll take the volume, the CAD, blast the um, simulated fluid through it, which will be the plastic. They see how everything kind of warps and flows through there, and then they'll do a simulation of like all the pins that push the part out. Uh, make sure it's getting oh, even cool. pressure so you're not pushing on one spot more than the other so it doesn't come out canted. Or... How do you actuate the pins typically? So the pins are, it's very like, so the, the actual tool, the, the, the um, Corsa, i got to remember it, um, is usually uh, two giant metal plates and it, they're spring loaded. Oh, cool. So that all the pins are in there and then it retracts, it actually compresses and the pins push oh, that's awesome. the part out. So. Um, so you're just pushing like, a plate against a bunch of spring-loaded pins. Yeah, you're basically. just retracting it, and then when yeah. it retracts, those two plates will compress, and then your part will actually stick right out. That's all awesome. pop right out, and you either either falls down into a bin, or you, some places will have a robot arm. Oh, so it. it's just part of the natural retraction, like it, it retracts yeah. against the back. Yeah, they're just using the, the standard motion of opening the tool. If like you pull far enough, it, it basically just kicks that part right out. Yeah, that's super clever, like in its simplicity. Yeah, so when you're at like, you know, a good like status quo, like the parts, the, the, the tool will close, a couple seconds, it'll open, part falls, and then the tool will close and you're just getting parts every 20, 60 seconds or whatever it is. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really Life cool. And then good. you go and you see like dozens of these machines like pumping up parts everywhere. So you, I'm guessing you build one first, and once you get it going, that's when you start having duplicate molds and, and yeah. So there's times like, um, well, it depends on like productions. So um, your production needs. So if you're at volumes and you can't afford downtime, you might actually get multiple tools. Interesting. Or you can do multiple cavities. So yeah. uh, there's some parts that we have for moms where uh, just the volumes we have to support will have like four cavities. Yeah. Eight cavities. So you'll have eight every eight time parts opens, being made at a time. Eight parts will fall out of that. And you know you don't have to run that tool so many times because every tool has like a, a what's called a cycle life. You can only use yeah. it so many times before just the pressure and the abrasiveness of the resin. What does that typically look like? Uh, I guess on like a just a regular polypropylene, you know, with no glass or anything. So it depends on who makes your tool. Fair so enough. That's actually one of those things. <laughs> it gets into the debate of like U.S. and um, Chinese manufacturing commonly, at least yeah. from my uh, experience. So uh, U.S. you can easily get a million shot tool, even wow. more if, with really good maintenance. I've heard. Five, 10 million shots. That's incredible. Um, in Asia, I mean, I'm sure there's no shortage on how far you on the low end you can go, but you can easily, you know, half a million to a million shots. Cool. And that's just like a benchmark you set. I'm sure they could hit higher if they wanted it to. It hits higher or lower. Money. If you're using yeah. like a, a glass filled plastic, that's going to be way more abrasive on your tool. Yeah, that makes something sense. like you said, like a, a Polypro or an ABS, that's going to be pretty, pretty. You're yeah, because be you're shooting run. abrasive through it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're shooting like liquid sandpaper effectively through it, and it's going to eventually tear it all down. That makes sense. Yeah. How can I ask, like, roughly in terms of order of magnitude, how much that that decreases the life of the tool? Like, do you go from like a million to ten thousand, or like a million to a hundred thousand? In terms of the resin, um, I I think it's more of like a. You could call it like a two x. Okay. Maybe well, it's, it's not, it's, uh, it's not huge orders of magnitude. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, you could have got a million, but because you were shooting this abrasive stuff, you're probably going to get half. It makes sense. Well, thank you, by the way, for like yeah, indulging no me in all these. I feel like a kid in a candy shop with the with the knowledge right now. I'm just like, oh, yeah, and like I said, I, I like I know a decent amount, but like there's like whole other orders of magnitude like deeper you can go into the injection molding. It's like that with every crazy kind of collapsible core mechanisms for doing. Like, What's collapsible core? So if you want to, like, if you take a soda cap, look at it and. Think about the threads underneath. Oh, interesting. Now, how do you design that without an undercut? You can't, right? Yeah. That's a good so point. there's a thing called a collapsible core where it's a chunk of metal that goes up in there, expands, you mold it, collapses <laughs> so you can pull it out. That's pretty amazing. How do you we, do that? We never used it personally for moms, but um, that class, again, I, I mentioned, that's, yeah. they, sh they have I'm trying to think how you would even set. do that for a soda can. Like, I, I guess you'd have to sacrifice uh, resolution and precision because you'd have gaps in the, in the uh, stamping. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah. So that's it's, interesting. it's really cool stuff. Like, I mean, I, I tell everyone, like, just look at, like, things you buy, like consumer products. If you rip it open, look at it, just, like, think about how people mold that stuff. So that's how you see the B side is you have to take a thing apart. Right. Like, that's the thing. Like, I took apart a, a tablet and just looking at, like, the back housing of, like, all these snaps. And you can see, like, little vestiges of, like, um, 
where the gate is, which is where the plastic comes in, which is actually probably the easiest thing most people see. It's, it's that like kind of sh sometimes sharp, but it's the circular part on our plastic. That's where the plastic comes in. Oh, cool. Uh, and then where it spreads out, but then you can see little things like the snaps because there's an undercut. They have to use a lifter. So if you look at like a snap, there's a little rectangular. Um, What's a uh, snap? Like just like snap up. So like uh, if you take a Kindle apart, yeah, where I actually learned it. Uh, there's no screws to hold the two pieces. Oh, I see. They use, okay. they use snap fasteners, but every one of the snaps is kind of like a, a horseshoe shape. Yep. So that creates an undercut. So the only way to do that, you have to use this mechanism called a lifter, which kind of looks like um, uh, like a, a door mechanism, like, like for your door in your house. It's this okay. little little mechanism that pokes out when you're uh, shooting the plastic. And oh, then cool. It, it retracts when you're done shooting the plastic. And it's Same. actually all tied into the same mechanism as the ejector pins. That's awesome. It's just a slightly different timing. So like it retracts before the ejector pins pull out. So that way you don't like try to push the part as it's... And I'm guessing yeah, so you, you get, get that just by having a longer pin, pin on the end? Or correct. Yeah, there's like a cam mechanism yeah. in there that it will cause the lifters to pull back before the pins push the part out. It's really clever. Yeah. yeah. Some, Some of these things are really cool. It's, it's, it's very much, if you're into like steampunk or like pure like mechanism stuff, like yeah. looking at tool design is very much... I mean, that stuff is fascinating to me. Like, I mean, what, what self-respecting engineer with any mechanical background doesn't love like a mechanical computer of some sort. Exactly. That's exactly what it reminds me of. It's like the old like mechanical calculators and computers. It's really cool. Yeah, that stuff is fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Again, I appreciate yeah. the insights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. What, there was something else I wanted to ask about, but I'm kind of blanking on it at the moment. Um, oh, we started talking about the CMU Robotics Club. Maybe it'd be fun mm -hmm. to, to kind of go back into that. So yeah. First of all, like, when did you, can I ask when you graduated? Or like yeah, so I, I graduated around? 2006, cool. uh, December, December 2006, 2006 with master's and um, undergrad. So I got my master's in 2014, so quite a bit later. Okay, a little long, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> cool. So uh, did you know a guy named, uh, I want to say, the heck, um, ah, it'll come back to me. There, there's one of the guys that said he worked on that battle bot, right, Matt, recently, out mm -hmm. in the industry. I'm trying to remember, but I just cannot, for the life of me, recall this guy's name. But um, okay, so GR, you were you were a TA for how he chose this general robotics course, which yep. I, I took it as a pit student. I found out you could cross register in one CMU course really? per semester as a CCAC or a pit student, hmm. and I think you could do the same. Like you could register in a CCAC course from CMU if you wanted to, and it would mm -hmm. be free because there's like this exchange program, um, and so. Um, yeah, it's kind of neat, and I, I just did it. I found out about it as a junior in undergrad, uh, and ever since then, I just was always registered in a CMU course, because, you know, why not? Like, it's right. a lot of knowledge and people to meet and interesting stuff. And so um, I, I did how he shows it's general robotics, and I did John Dolan's mechatronic design. Oh, yeah, I did that, too, yeah. for nice. uh, master's That's, that's well. a great, great class. And so they had that for, like, a decade. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. And they, it's, it was around for a while, even before, so probably, I don't say two decades, but at least, yeah. Least that was probably my favorite one. Like, I'm not, sorry, Howie. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think general robotics is good. It's a great filter. Some people take it, they're like, oh, I'm going to learn about robotics, and they take it, and they're like, I don't want to do robotics anymore. So yeah, I think it's a really good filter class. And then the people who love it do the mechatronics class or yeah. the other big project classes. And then, like, I feel like the, the GR was more of a beat you up class than the mechatronics class. It definitely class. was. Yeah. I think it was a lot so more. The mechatronics class was fun. The GR class was torturous. <laughs> like, yeah, I think, exactly. exactly. Still yeah. fun. But that, like, that's why I say it's a filter, filter class, because yeah. I think it was really to feel, uh, like, you know, filter out those folks that really want to get into robotics, and those who maybe are just like, oh, robotics is a buzzy term. Let me go check it out. And then they're just like, <laughs> oh, no, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So for people listening, there was, there was an assignment in that class. So a few things about it. I guess they condensed an insane amount of knowledge into a course. Um, as a pit student, I think I spent more time on the coursework for that course than my four pit classes I was in combined, you know, at the same time. Like I, I would, I, more than half my time went to GR and then four pit classes took less time than that. So that was interesting. Um, then there was the uh, unmanned search and rescue assignment. So I don't know if it was every week or every other week, you had to like do a new thing. And so did they use the NXT when you were in it, or was it a different, I don't even know. No, it, it, it was around. like an M MIT brainstem or something. Interesting. It was, it was like a controller they used at like MIT classes, and it was, talking to all the software folk, they said it was brutal, but I mean, keep in mind, it's 2006, like Arduino was not even a thing yet. Yeah, yeah. Our controllers were still, 
still had that like hurdle of entry of getting the basic stamp that. would have still been on the scene at that point, right? Like, a little bit, like on its exactly. Way out. Yeah, basic yeah. stamp was still kind of like in its prime or just coming off of it. I think Arduino yeah. was still a good like five ish years out. out. Yeah, that, that changed the game, the Arduino. I mean, the basic stamp was brutal to try to do anything on. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't remember exactly like what it was like to program it just because it's been so long, but I just remember it being bad. Like you had to do hacky stuff. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing was just like the access of it. Like you actually had to buy the compiler with it and install the compiler. Whereas <laughs> like Arduino, there's all these libraries and everything. You've got an integrated access. compiler in your IDE, which yeah, exactly. made, it, made it pretty accessible. Okay, right, so unmanned search and rescue. So when I did it, we were trying to build like a miniature version. So how we chose to probably use the September 11th example with you because he did with us. Mm -hmm. So for people listening, search and rescue obviously is like when you send a robot in or a person in, but in this case a robot that's unmanned, to look for people in a wreckage or in some disaster site or like in a mountain where a skier is lost or you know something like that. And so... We built miniature, uh, like little teeny, like in our case about that big, like maybe like eight by eight inches, but like eight inch cube robots to go into this course and, and look for like cardboard cutouts of people basically. Okay, so you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ours were action figures with I think pictures of either TAs or teachers. That's hilarious. Ours were cardboard cutouts with pictures of TAs and teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, th I think ours was like Egypt themed because like how he had done mm -hmm. something in the pyramids with like oh yeah and so they, they brought that theme back in what was yours like ours, ours was, was just like a foam court like a building okay like just so because like you said it was probably like we'll we spinning distance of 9-11 so it was yeah. all like it was like a very simple like two-story complex where there were stairs going up to like a balcony and then there was a lower part with like rubble and things cool yeah we had something similar too yeah and nobody knew what the course was going to be like. And you stayed up for, like, I think we had two weeks to build it, if I remember correctly, maybe three. Yeah, it's like a blur because I just remember yeah. constantly being up. I didn't sleep. Yeah, <laughs> they were, we were in the Robo Club. Um, I don't think we spent any time in the Field or Box Center. Mainly in Robo Club. And then I remember we, we sort of wanted to be secretive about our design, which mm -hmm. I, it screwed us. There was, there was a sumo comp. Did you guys have the sumo competition too? Yeah, I think there was like sumo. Yeah. yeah. So on the sumo one, that, that was like one of my first lessons in like field testing because mm. we, we built our own sumo court to be secretive and try to just beat everybody. Mm. I can't remember what our secret side, like either it was geared really low or we just had like some kind of clever thing that, you know, was going to somehow win us this competition. And <laughs> I think we would have won because it, Basically what happened was there was there was like a black inside and like a white outer ring for the sumo court and it was like a plywood circle or something. And um, ours was like a slightly different shade of those colors and so the light sensor that was looking down wasn't tuned correctly for the actual court and so we just lost like the qualifying match and then just got kicked out of the competition. And it took 10 seconds to fix and we like challenged a bunch of people to rematch just one all of them. But because we had screwed ourselves over from the beginning, it didn't matter. So that was, that was a great man. lesson. Yeah. Field testing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's what we get for trying to be secretive and sneaky, you know, like do, do it on our own. So yeah, we, we had like a, like a curtain around it in the Robo Club and like nobody else was allowed in, you know. It's, of course, that we lost. And then it was like similar with the Unmanned Search and Rescue. So we built this rig that had like... Um, so there was a pan tilt unit made from two hobby servos with a little camera on it that had a wireless, like some kind of crappy CCTV system mm. that sent that out. I think the class provided that. It was probably the same one that was there when you did it. Probably, yeah. Because they were, they were fucking dog shit. <laughs> very, very... Yeah, I think they had like a CRT TV. Yeah, yeah, we might have as well, to be honest. Or that, or it was like a VGA monitor with like a, some kind of adapter. Of yeah, the yeah, I just distinctly there. remember like the line, the actual like... Lines from like a CRT analog. Yeah, well, I think I think ours was like it was like taking like a coax input or something and like putting it through a VGA converter into right. a flat screen. So it was yeah. probably the same tech with like another step because nobody had CRT TVs anymore. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's funny. And it, there were like two channels, and it was like there were like thirty teams trying to run theirs at the same time, yep. and the interference was horrible. And maybe you could shoot like ten feet of video, you know, or whatever. And you're, you know, it's just it was just pretty brutal. And so you couldn't really see what you were doing. We had an LED array that was uh, like almost like a ring light, but I think it was four like actual LEDs that you know we'd like soldered resistors onto, and put like some kind of a multi-stranded cable going down 
I think we use multi-stranded. Coming <laughs> down there. <laughs> this gimbaling unit. That had the camera on it. And then, because we had a LEGO NXT, they had a whole bunch of features, and then we had an Arduino built into ours. So mm -hmm. we used the Arduino to parse I2C from the NXT, because that's what it uses to communicate. But I think they were RJ11 uh, jacks. Okay. And so you, you take an I2C signal from that, you decode it, which took like two days to figure out by itself how to get that to talk in a way that was in any way stable. And then that would send, um, it would trigger off and on. I think we used TIP120 transistors to toggle the lights. So we had the ones that were on the cameras and then we had a separate one that was like the robot like body lights. So it was like a light bar on an off-road vehicle. Then because ours was so bulky, we had a four bar mechanism for flipping it back over if it got flipped on its back, but not on its side. Nice. So you were just screwed if it fell outside. And then um, there was, uh, it was just, it was just classic over engineering, over complicating the task and just getting caught up in the, you know, the kind of the fun of making it way more complicated than it needed to be. And yeah. so, of course, we also lost that because we were all sleep deprived and, uh, you know, our robot was too complicated. I mean, everything I think worked on the robot, but our brains were addled. I was going to say, part of it is the driver, right? Caffeine, you know, sleep sure deprivation. Driver and yeah, so I was the driver. I had two navigators. One said go left, one said go right. I drove straight into the wall, and I think threw it because we put a lot of heft on our thing. And this course was over, underbuilt out of Home Depot foam board. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we just got disqualified. <laughs> so, I just distinctly remember being pissed because it was like... It's a miracle I passed that we, class. We totally passed like a foot or something. They had like one of the figures like buried under rubble enough that all you could see is a foot and then like the head on the other side ah. so like we distinctly drove past it like easily three times and just through that like, fuzzy like yeah you could see because it was like fuzzy yeah. and i don't think we had enough lights on it and Poor just being like pissed when i saw it, I was like oh, damn it we could have got that one yeah <laughs> brutal <laughs> did you have uh, like what kind of features did you put on yours just like i think we i was trying to emulate like the uh, irobot packbot oh cool like little flip like flippers in the front but it's all like track surfaces so the main body has tracks and then the front has tracks as well so how did you build that uh it was just basically like a little like separate motor for a differential in the front that would allow me to like drive the flippers but then the tr all the tracks were all tied together so when you drove forward all the tracks would spin that's and awesome. You can try to drive the flippers up and down. What did you um, use for your, your tracks or your pulleys? I think we just used like the Lego chain. Nice. So we just kind of, it was all that great. I don't think it, it really, because we had a hard time trying to get up the steps. Yeah, brutal. But yeah, it was, it was good. It was fun. It was, I can't remember how we stair climbed. There was, we had some mechanism for doing it, but I, for the life of me, I cannot remember what we did. I remember one team having just like a giant mass that just like appeared. So they just kind of like, rather than getting to the body, they just kind of like, <laughs> they raised a mat and they just like had like a little pan tilt zoom camera and they just looked and they're just like someone's there someone's there although I think they missed one or two because the the upper stairs had like a balcony oh. so they couldn't see over it unless that's they funny. drove over but they just kind of like stayed put and just looked around <laughs> that's pretty clever yeah I, I is that the same cool. guy that made like a blimp for like a stair climber that just touched all the stairs with like a ribbon I heard a story about a guy that did that I'm sure there'd be like very interesting stories over the years from that class. Or like there was a Jenga robot, I remember. Like, did you guys do the Jenga one as well? No. Nah. So we had to play Jenga with a robot, <laughs> and there was one guy that apparently like put down a mechanism that just blocked the opponent, <laughs> so they couldn't <laughs> access the Jenga tower. <laughs> like they had like a sheet over it, and that was yeah, the that's first. Half the move. stuff is just being really creative with the rules, man. Yeah. That's that, that's pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've had issues with like engineers when I was doing like. You know, on like contract projects, so like some of the SKA stuff, like I had one engineer that really, really thought that way, but it was awesome. But, you know, it was like to the point where like if we listened to this guy, the customer would be so pissed off at us. Because it was like, dude, we're not trying to, sub like, they're not an adversary. Like we're trying to help them. Like, right. we don't, technically, yes, <laughs> that's what they asked for, but I don't think they're going to like that, you know? So. Yeah, I have learned that there's yeah. definitely a distinction between what a customer asks for and what they actually want. It's really like you got to navigate between the two. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And oftentimes, like, I feel like communication is the way to do it. Yeah, that. and that's the thing. You can just hey, what do you think about it? Like, hey, what do you mean by this? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, just this, this, this. Would you be open to this? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm trying to think. I think it was like on, like, I'm thinking of an example. I think it was on a, an algorithm for a, um, we'll say a dexterous manipulation system. Um, and... Like, 
the the code that this guy wrote didn't quite hit all the things. So he's like, well, what if we interpret it this way? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you know, like, well, don't try to use bad data. Huh? Yeah, not 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 in this particular use case. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Sorry, like we gotta, you know, I mean, the good news is you're being paid by the hour. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that was fun. Did you ever do Mobot? Mobot, I, not personally, oh. but I was, when I was in Roboclub, a lot of the other people did. Yeah. Which I think what I was, I was doing, I had tank chair, so it was like a desk chair with tank tracks on it. Huh. But I, I so I found these snowblower tracks that I think they sold them on Robot Marketplace, if you remember, like the BattleBot. Yep, I know exactly. And so there were these surplus snowblower tracks, and I, I totally cannibalized them. They had like an input, I think it was like uh, like bicycle chain on the inside or maybe motorcycle mm -hmm. chain. And then that took like a three-quarter inch uh, steel shaft, and uh, it had, I think, like probably ABS bushings, uh, although I might be wrong in the material, some kind of plastic. Yeah. And um, it took that chain uh, and it chain drove a uh, rubberized track. And so um, we modified those to take like a wheelchair motor at the input mm. and had a tube steel frame that was welded onto the tracks. And then we attached that to a swivel chair like the ones you and I are sitting in now. Just and drive it around campus? Yeah, and... at one point I crashed it through a, uh, a, a wall, a uh, <laughs> drywall that went right through. <laughs> Weighed maybe like 150 pounds. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I did a, um, one of my master's classes was like uh, human robot interaction, but like it was a little bit different. It was under, um, I think it was Elon Norbosch was doing it. Oh, cool. And it was, we had to create like a, basically emotional robot experiment and build stuff for it. So what we did was we made a, we took an ottoman from Target, <laughs> gutted it, put a uh, omni wheel platform in it. So it's like full, like holonomic, base in nice. all directions and then uh, it was a black leather so we took it and brought it to the UC at CMU where there's all these black chairs and we put it there <laughs> and then we were up in the upper balcony <laughs> watching we, we wanted to see I think the theory was well the theory was we just wanted to build a robotoman yeah, we wanted to use that name, Robotoman. Yeah, Robotoman, that's hilarious. Uh, but I think the theory was like, oh, we wanted to the see how, Empire. how. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to see how people interact with a non-talking robot. So this thing, all it could do is move. And most people were pretty good. Like, it was pretty cute. Like, people would, like, sit on it uh, or, like, sit in the chair, put their feet up on it. And, like, you pull it out. Yeah, I pull it out. And, like, people would, like, kind of talk to it. And, like, we would, like, drive. It was all remote control. There's no autonomy. And, like, we would, like, yeah. spin it and, like, try to do, like, very R2-D2, like, gestures and stuff. And people yeah. were pretty cool. And then there was this one guy, man. He lost it. He was, like, <laughs> he was, like, yelling at it. Did you film it? Oh, I, I wish I knew where the video was. We totally filmed it. <laughs> That's awesome. But, like, one guy was yelling yeah, at so it. So we could splice that in. And then, like, he, like, <laughs> kicked it. And I was like, <laughs> and then I was like, all right. Then, like, he, he, like, kicked it over. And then I was like, all right, I'm annoyed with this dude. So, like, we went down. We're like, you know, what's going on? Like, you know, do you have a problem? He's like, he's like, I don't know what this thing is. It could be a bomb. I'm like, why would you kick it? <laughs> <laughs> you think it's a bomb? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, he's, yeah, I, I think he just thought it was going to be at the, the end of a joke or something, butt of a joke. And I was I get that, but like, yeah, fair. But, but, but like, we came school. off of like yeah. dozens of people interacting with it, laughing at it, and yeah. this one guy just really got angry with it. So. I remember one time I, I was like drinking in Squirrel Hill, and you know, as you do, like I, I was kind of sleeping it off on a on a bench, and um, you know, <laughs> not my proudest moment, but I, you know, it's one of the things I did when I was an undergrad. And I slept on an air hockey table in the robotics club. Nice. Night, so. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I did that too. They showed me the security footage. There was me on. Uh, Whatever that table was, it might have been the same table. It was like in the front area. Yeah, that's probably yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were like, what's up with this? And I'm like, well, would you rather I have driven home? They're like, oh, we're fine with that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. But anyway, so I was sleeping on this bench in Squirrel Hill, or not really sleeping, just like taking a quick nap yeah. like, before I go back. And um, this guy's like, what are you, homeless? Like, he's like trying to fight me. I'm like, is this how you treat homeless people? Like, yeah. that's horrible. You know? Like, yeah. I don't know. It was, it was weird, like, to see a person get that angry at another human being you know yeah it's like this is presumably it? had no recourse you know because thought i was homeless this is this is the hill you're gonna die on this is your battle this is yeah. what you want to fight yeah exactly it was, it was weird I, I had another experience where i was in the czech republic i don't know i shouldn't be saying these <laughs> but i will anyway and uh i was like out dancing all night and um i i had because i was like at like a club just dancing and moving around and 
I, I sweated through my hoodie, and I, I like to dress down when I travel just so I can interact more and I don't come off like a tourist. I want people to think I'm from there. Right. And so I was just wearing a hoodie and a ratty T-shirt and I think like some messed up pants. And I, I ran out of charge on my cell phone, which had my you know Google Maps on it, and I didn't know where my Airbnb was. I was totally reliant. And so I was going into the same shops I'd been in the day before. I figured out how to get back to the neighborhood because I memorized the transit system. But like I just didn't know what turn. So I was like circling the block and I kept go had to go to different shops and charge my phone and nobody would let me into their shop. They all thought I was a homeless guy. Oh, and man. so finally I went into like this um Vietnamese owned grocery shop and I'm like, Hey, can I charge my phone while I shop? And the lady was like, No. And I was like, what if I give you, you know, the equivalent of $5, you know, it was like yeah. 20, whatever their money is. I can't remember off the top of my head. And she was like, um, oh, well, of course, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I don't need your money. You know, the fact that I had money legitimized my, my presence. And I, I think I still gave her the money because I like wanted her to feel like a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> but like, which I'm sure she was like, thanks for the money. You know? like, crap what you think. But, you know, it's like kind of. Kind of funny, so I don't know. That's interesting that the guy got angry at the auto man. That's that's yeah, weird that people react like, that way. It's just so, yeah, for sure. Let's see, I'm trying to think of any other weird social experiments because I feel like those are fun. Mm -hmm. It's the only one I, I know of that. Yeah, I feel like I feel like you don't do stuff like that after college as much. <laughs> you don't now, unless you're actually starting uh, up a TV show. There's one I saw at Case Western where they did that, but with a porta potty. Mm, so it was yeah. it was a porta potty <laughs> with um, it had two wheelchair motors and a caster on it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a non non holonomic, but uh, right. yeah, they, a diff drive, and they had uh, and they would just interact with people with a porta potty, like following them. Around. I think the, the the move was to have the porta potty follow people around. <laughs> And then I remember when I was a kid, there was another one I did where I found this watch that Casio made that was a universal remote. Mm -hmm. And so you, you knew about this product? I think I remember it. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a Casio I remember buying that was one of the first ones you can like, quote, program with your computer. Yeah. You like held it up to the CRT and it would do like scan lines in such a way that you can like set alarms. Oh, that's cool. Computer. Yeah. That's, and then they had the one that was a, like a camera too, or it yep. was like one of the first you know, digital cameras. So that one was really cool. There was this, um, and for some reason, me and my friends were just like, we were just terrorists in school. And so at Winchester Thurston, we were like, must have been in fifth grade. We were, um, we were like trying to like do impressions of all the teachers and have like their picture on like a website that had this bad recording of us trying to sound like them. And so one of the teachers just did not want her photo taken. And so my friend went in with the watch and like took her photo that way. <laughs> And then I had the watch that was a universal remote. So I would like be with my parents in like a pub and, mm -hmm. um, or like a family restaurant, like a TGIF or something. And there would be some guy watching the game. And like my favorite thing to do was <laughs> to like, you know, like change the channel on him while I was watching the game and like wait for him to get super upset and like get the, the manager and then change it back before the manager could see it. <laughs> did you ever, he did it like five times. The guy starts to question it. Did you ever see the, uh, heard of the, it's called the TV Be Gone? TV Be Gone, yes. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It was this like little keychain that you can carry around that I guess had all the codes for like all the IR based TVs that would just turn off TV. So if like you're in a place like a bar, yeah. you could just turn it off. <laughs> But yours is more sinister because you're actually flipping it back on when the manager comes by. Yeah, so it was you really just think the guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Just gaslighting a person you never even met. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, I guess as like a fucking fourteen year old, that was really really amusing oh, yeah, at the totally, time. Yeah. Or Twelve year old even. You know, yeah, exactly. Like prank calls, all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I had I had one friend that would call uh, the the Walgreens and ask ask for ibuprofen, and we thought it was hilarious, <laughs> <laughs> mispronouncing ibuprofen. <laughs> <laughs> Just all chuckle. Yeah. yeah. I remember all the days of like the Simpsons, the prank calls to Bo's bar. You know. If I ever find you, <laughs> I found you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was good. Jerky Boys, I think, was like a thing. Jerky Boys, that's yeah. probably, yeah. 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 There was a podcast, or, yeah, I think it was a podcast called The Bone Zone mm. that we liked when I was an undergrad. So this would have been, like, 2010s. And um, it was it was a lot of prank calls, and then just, like, they, they would waste everyone's time, including the listener. And so it was just, 
you know, just the most asinine stuff you could think of. And it was, it was incredibly fun. Uh, and so I, I sort of, that's, that was our inspiration for the ibuprofen gag. Nice. You ever do, um, like, since we're talking about, like, you know, past days, you ever do the trash diving around Carnegie Mellon? Oh, yeah, all the time. What, what were some of the best things you found? Uh, I'm trying to remember. We actually did a little bit of diving in the basement of Noel Simon because it was... That was a really good one. That was always a good one because uh, they were doing a mass purge because, I guess, it kept flooding at yeah. the time. Yeah, well, they always do that, like, like every five... Yeah, three years like, or this so. all has to go. So I got yeah. like a really nice. Usually Chuck is the one clearing it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got like a really nice like aluminum like attaché case. I have this old oh, that's like cool. really old like recording mechanism. I ditched the recording mechanism, but I had the attaché case, which was really nice. Um, I got a Brentronic Soldier portable battery charger from nice. the Iraq War that way. <laughs> nice. And I gutted it and just was using the case like as a Pelican case. Nice. Yeah, we uh, Robocop always just got random calls usually from like. Researchers will just be like, hey, I have a bunch of whatever it is if you guys want it. They turned down a lot of stuff, too. We had to, because, like, yeah. um, so when I was at Robotics, so we used to be in the Planetary Robotics building, which was the building. Oh, interesting. Used to be where the uh, Gates building is now. Yep. Uh, so we well, it still is, I think. Like, it's just on a floor of, but there was a whole building for it, though. I didn't realize Yeah, that. it was a whole building. It was a really, now really, it's really, a Planetary Robotics be, high bay, and I think it's yeah, in the Yeah, it used to be the mining and science but like they used to do like old industrial stuff like it was a horrible place because like the floors were like asbestos tiles and, like, <laughs> there's like roaches that came out of like there's like channels in the ground to run like utility lines oh there still are in the Hatfield robotic center yeah that's true <laughs> and um yeah we actually moved it my generation we had to move it to the uc um where it is now or i guess so you set that up yeah yeah i got a lot of a lot of nights in there yeah the uh, the, the <laughs> giant lathe that was one that was donated to us that was the 1930s the, uh like the the liberty ship lathe or whatever yeah it was. that was yeah. given to us by the ri they're like we don't want this anymore you guys want it so you know they gave it how'd to you us. get that in there because i feel like it's bigger than the so the behind door. the uc which i think has a new name now it's like the cohen center or... yeah the cohen university center yeah, yeah. so um behind it there is on the side where like Forbes is. There's yeah, some grates. Sure, university stuff. So. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a great. There's some grates there. You can actually see behind the. I think it's the gymnasium, and then it's like a 15 foot drop through those grates. They actually picked those up and then they got riggers to. Oh, interesting. Lift that lathe, bring it down, and then they they were able to wheel it dolly in all the way. That's so that cool. Room. Yeah, it was really cool. I, yeah. I gotta see if I still have pictures of this like lathe hanging like sixteen feet in the air. Yeah, I would like if you do send them in and we'll, we'll edit it in. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was pretty neat. And then yeah, just setting up all that shop because uh, yeah, we had to, like negotiate with the, the the student activities body to like give us the right space because they were gonna give us like this tiny space that was gonna be like a third of what we got. And, oh wow! Yeah, thank you like, for doing that too. You do not realize how many members we have, so we were like pulling cloud, and then we got like people at the RI to like push for us and. That always yes. helped. So I'm guessing Tanner was involved even then. I forgot who our... You always had, like, a faculty person. I think Matt Mason was oh, our, our, like, faculty person for a while. But then it changed well. over, I think, to George Cantor. That makes sense. Yeah, George Cantor was during my time. Like, yeah, I think he was the was, second, the next person over. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but, yeah, like, we had to set all that up, and we brought all that... All that furniture was actually already made by... Um, coincidentally, it was actually built by um, the C CTO of Agility Robotics, Jonathan actually? Hurst. Yeah, he built cool. all that stuff. He built <laughs> it like the, the monster shelf in the corner of the robotics shelf. Shelf of Prime. Yeah, uh, shelf of Prime. That's it. Yeah, yeah. he, <laughs> he built shelf. all that and that stuff. <laughs> those those the tables will be there for eternity. Like they yeah. even in my personal garage, I like borrowed some of the designs and yeah. built tables. Based That's on awesome. The design in my garage. So. so he built those in there, and like they just never left. Yeah, they never left. We moved them because they were just so badass and like incredible. We just moved them over to the new space. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember. Um, <laughs> Building like, the stuff you would do with wood was pretty hilarious. So like the wood shop in the basement of the Field Robotics Center. Yeah. Did you ever build a wooden robot? I think we talked about it. We never actually built it. We started to build one and we never finished it. So there was, uh, for something I, I tried to do a wooden. I won't say what because it's a little weird. But like we <laughs> tried to do a wooden telepresence robot, mm -hmm. and the idea was to have it lift up onto two wheels, but like mostly be a dolly. But mm -hmm. you, I wanted to like try like intentionally breaking the uncanny valley by make not uncanny. You know the design principle that says a robot should be shorter than a person because it can be intimidating if it's like eight feet tall? I don't know the specific one, it makes sense. I wanted to make an eight foot robot that was intentionally intimidating to be tall. Intimidating wooden robot? Yeah, it's like a creek. When you move that Lord of the Rings tree end. Yeah, it's a tree creature. And uh, George Cantor actually talked me out of it. I was, was going to do it, and then he was like, do not do that. And so, <laughs> 
Yeah. So we got as far as a dolly, which is now my coffee table. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a few late night projects. I remember just sitting around like a couple other members and we were there. And I think the craziest thing we did, this is back again when we were in the PRB, so like, not only do we have a whole building to ourselves, we also had like a whole parking lot out there of like no cars. And I think it was, um, yeah, it was probably like two or three in the morning. We got a um, <laughs> five gallon like water jug for like a water dispenser. Yep. Um, we took that and filled it with isopropyl, sloshed it around, <laughs> put it on a rod, lit it, and just shot it like 40, 50 feet. That's amazing. In the back. Because we're just like, like oh, we're bored. Let's go make a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> What's explosive here? And we just like, you put like, I got isopropyl. I got this bottle. Let's go see what we can do. We didn't expect like. It was crazy because like you slosh it around, you have to get the right air fuel mix. Yeah, so, like, you slosh it, so you and then you're lighting it, and nothing's happening. Like you light a little bit, and then all of a sudden the air mix just gets right and just, goes, <laughs> and this thing is just gone, and you're just like, Rah! like you don't want to get hit in the head with it as you run away. Yeah, of course. <laughs> when I was, I remember, I think I was in high school at the time. I was like a freshman or a sophomore in high school. We were making fireworks out of SD's model rocket engines and mm. gunpowder from Dick's Sporting Goods and then bits from real fireworks. <laughs> and, and I think we had like chemicals we stole from the high school chemistry lab. So like potassium permanganate, magnesium mm. um, chunks and, and powder. And so the potassium permanganate, I think burned purple, magnesium was white. And so you could get the effects you were looking for. And then we had like bits we cannibalized from, you know, Roman candles and nice. stuff. Yeah, it was fun. And you know, and, so I remember we did this one, and I, I just had a really vicious dog at the time. Uh, it was the you know the family dog, and she like attacked me while I was carrying this and bit one of the fins off. And I didn't want to miss the night of fireworks, so I just taped it back on with duct tape, <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> and so um, we we set the thing up and we we detonated it, and the fin that was taped on broke off immediately, <laughs> and the thing just corkscrewed after me and my brother and my uncle. Did they call that the crazy Ivan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just it just it must have, it must have been like like it felt like maybe like a fourteen foot diameter circle it was going around it, but like coming toward us like a little bit more every time it spiraled, and so you know, I think we this was this would have been in Ithaca, New York. We like jumped. It was it was a thing called Sunset Park. We there were these little um, like observations. So it was a beautiful view of the city. You could watch the sunset at mm -hmm. Sunset Park, and there were these little um, like concrete and like cinder block. Or like maybe they were, it was like stonework. There were these stonework structures mm. where you could like hang out in there with a date and hold hands and drink a glass of wine or whatever, or like, you know, have a picnic. And so we were, uh, we ducked behind one of those so we didn't get hit by shrapnel when the thing exploded, <laughs> you know, like 20 feet from the ground. <laughs> so. Yeah, my only experience with model rockets is obviously lighting the model rockets, but then I built like a little race car out of, um, I think it was Connects. And I was like, oh, I can oh, Connects go so really fast. fast. Jamming in the back, and then uh, <laughs> went to my high school. They had this really nice, like, long road, and like a it went up a hill. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, like an actual road. Yeah, it was like a little access road that went up the back of the school, and then, you know, I put it at the bottom of the hill, I lit it, or ignited it, and it, like, it shot off, went up this hill, <laughs> and, like, it, it went airborne, and I was like, oh, that's really cool, and then I guess the ejection charge popped, and the whole thing went. So there was, like, connects all over the... You got like half the next one. I totally forgot about the ejection charge, so it just exploded in midair. Yeah, and the, and the ones we made into explosives, we would, we would. Um, I can't remember how exactly we did. I think it wasn't the most safe mechanism. Like, we might have run a drill bit into it, just to get into there and create access, and that's what you would. You'd fill that cavity with gunpowder, and then that would detonate your souped-up ejection charge with all your fun bits of you know metal yep. in there. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, good times for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, there, there was a time where I was like, oh, I want to get into special effects. I thought that stuff. too. I mean, there's no money in it. And there isn't. No, I'm, I'm very happy I didn't go that way. Yeah, me but, too. <laughs> yeah, at the but time. When I saw Fury Road, I think that, and like, what I guess, what special effects did you see as a kid that made you want to get into it? I mean, again, Discovery Channel was like my life, and they had yeah. a lot of those shows. Of for sure. Of how we like, how they did the, I think it was like, Hunt for Red October for like um, submarine battle. Like they showed the special effects of like detonating these models of submarines underwater. They had like awesome little vacuum jars in it so it imploded because you don't actually get an explosion underwater. 
Um, and just like the background of that, of like how they had to pack the charges and do the charges, or like whenever they do films where people get shot, the squib charge. Yep, those are cool. Those and yeah. I just thought that was always really cool. And then again, like early phase of robotics, like that was the only place I remember robotics, like Jurassic Park. Yeah, right? or like uh, even <laughs> this is a lot less less cool, but like like barf from Spaceballs. If you think of like the tail wagging around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, movies were basically the first experience I had with robotics. I didn't realize, like, oh, you can do robotic cars and all this other yeah, academic stuff. And eventually, I got you know, more of that, thankfully. Yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, the first exposure was all like special effects. Yeah, same, actually. That's cool. And I always, I always was fascinated. So it's such a bad movie, but as a kid, my first like DVD I ever had was Wild Wild West. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, like, wanting that robotic spider that they had in that yep. and just thinking that was the coolest thing and wanting to figure out how to build one of those um and so yeah that spider and then um my other favorite was um you ever watched the original judge dread with uh, Sylvester stallone i haven't seen that okay sure. it's like this big like war robot in oh it. cool it's really cool looking i think it's like the ed 209 from robocop yeah okay so yeah like so, yeah, yeah exactly yeah that's awesome yeah i forgot about robocop that's judge a really good one I mean, they were. I think they were doing all the claymation, though. Yeah, it was, it was all stop motion, motion animation. I think it was like Jurassic Park, like ninety two, ninety three, where they were getting more heavily into animatronics and CGI. I think yeah. Just popping in. But some of the stuff that like Sarcos is still doing in that area is pretty cool. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I think Disney's like the main consumer of it, and Universal Studios. But I don't know if Sarcos is still making those products or not. I probably should know. Sorry, Sarcos. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it's probably not what's making them their money. You know? right. so, <laughs> but uh, like the Pirates of the Caribbean robots were always really cool to me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just, but yeah, I guess you know, not not always the most practical. There's, there's a class I took at CMU for my master's, entertainment engineering, and it, we talked a lot about that, like the background of like why things were designed in such a way for like Disney, like all the cool stuff, like everything is built. I think it's like four fifths scale at Disney. Because four fifths. I forgot the exact number. Don't quote me on the number, yeah. but it's basically no I, it's I just, a scale I just that know. like it makes kids feel big. Oh, interesting. but it makes adults feel like not so big. Like they're still like in the kid world. Like it's it's a very interesting. That's like so it's just a psychological. It's just a like, psychological thing. Yeah. How like Disney utilizes like all the senses. Like smell is a big one. Like they actually pump out smell throughout the park. For, like, interesting. Not just popcorn, but like for certain emotional states, they can pump really? out certain certain sense wild. that makes you feel a certain way because. From a memory standpoint, smell is basically one of the biggest drivers outside of taste. But you know, you can't no, that's true. Like people have like either really good or traumatic memories that can get triggered by smelling like a cologne or something. Yeah, you and know, then so. like what else? Like Disney, uh, all the upper floors are utilized for something. Like they might be, um, you know, restricted access for like people with either like terminal diseases and stuff like that. They let them rent. Like I think it's like Cinderella's castle. Like you actually have to be like terminal in order to to, to stay there. But like they do that. For kids with cancer and stuff like oh, that. Oh, and there's like rooms you can stay in that are just reserved. You can stay in that it's like they only do for like Make-A-Wish Foundation. That's interesting. Like it's it's really, really cool stuff. There's, there's enough stuff. demand from the Make-A-Wish Foundation to fill that room. Yeah, yeah they, they just, just do that and like they don't let like people buy their way in. Like it's just yeah, like this is not enough. This is for like those kids. Only and nobody only. else. Yeah. I wonder if people ever approach the kids' families and they're like, I know little Timmy <laughs> is going to die soon, but... <laughs> How would you like two hundred thousand dollars? I'm, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure there's some fun <laughs> yeah. stories for the people inside Disney about that. Um, my favorite though was the Hall of Presidents when they first launched it. Um, I remember hearing that they had changed the. I think they were hydraulically based or partially hydraulically based. So these are just wax figures of presidents. The, they're they're animated. They're, they're okay. animatronic. Audio. I think they called them audio and animatronics. But in the early days, some aspect of it was hydraulic based. Interesting. But um, I didn't know about that. The hydraulic fluid was red, and they had a leak. Oh, brutal. So they very quickly <laughs> learned from that to use a different Hopefully color. the Abe Lincoln, that'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard it was either like JFK or Lincoln, but I, I take That's that for right. yeah, but like, sure. I, I'm sure they learned real quick, do not make animatronic hydraulic fluid red. Like, That's interesting. <laughs> what color did they change it to? Just like white or something? Maybe clear. I mean, most like clear, yeah. either clear or like a yellow or something like that. Yeah, that seems pretty in innocuous, right? But like small things like that, yeah. just like it's Terrifies some kid forever. Exactly. They traumatize yeah. someone. I'm sure they gave him like free pass or something like yeah. that. Like, a lot of ice cream. A lot of ice cream, yeah. yeah. A little bit of ice cream covered. Yeah. But like, yeah, just those stories is so neat. Just like the design background behind all that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. No, I, I, 
the four fifths, or that I guess we won't say four fifths because no, no, yeah, how are you going to know? Miniaturized like, you know, adults, exactly. you know, is, is a cool idea. I mean, like that that never would have occurred to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, they must. I wonder how they came to that conclusion. Like, if they just focus grouped it, or I don't know. I mean, and I, I don't know if that originated in Disneyland, which is what they first built, or if that was more from Disney World, which they built a couple of decades later. Yeah, it makes sense. Learning from Disneyland, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Disney's an interesting thing because I don't know. I mean, it's I feel like I, as a kid, even I kind of didn't love Disney because I thought it was like a little too contrived and mm -hmm. like some of the movies. I'm like, yeah, this is cringy, even as a even as an eight year old. But then you know, at the same time, you got to give credit where credits due for building you know that level of sophistication into an entertainment experience. Yeah, I mean, I mean they're the kings of like emotional and psychological manipulation. Like, manipula yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but like yeah, they know how to drive Pixar. you there. Oh, like, they own Pixar. Yeah, and nostalgia. I mean, yeah. look at the, the properties they bought in Marvel and uh, Lucasfilm. That, that is interesting. Yeah, I guess you're right that they've just acquired those those assets. Yeah, right? I mean, I think the CEO I read I was reading the CEO at the time was talking about like uh, it started with Pixar because he was walking around the park and they licensed the Toy Story characters from Pixar because Pixar was independent at the time. Yeah. And he was looking around and he realized that all the kids were in love with the Pixar characters, not, they weren't, they didn't dislike Mickey, but like there was more interest in those characters and he figured like, for the future of the company, we have to buy Pixar. So we bought Pixar. Oh, and interesting. That kind of, you know, kind of started it of like, all right, you know, Mickey's great, but like we have to continue like creating new IP or, yeah. or acquiring IP. Mickey's great, but he's a bit 1930s. Yeah, yeah he's <laughs> almost, he's open, uh, almost open domain soon, or public domain, I should say. Unless they change the laws again. Unless they change the laws. <laughs> it's close. I think it's only another couple of years. I heard it's coming up. At least it's Steamboat Willie Mickey. Those are, those are the Mickey Mouse laws, right? So yeah. um, I'm going to get this wrong, but basically the, the copyright, was it the Millennium? No, it wasn't Millennium. It was copyright... Yeah, I don't know. They they added to it so many act times or something. Now. It's like seventy years after the creators. But it just yeah. kept getting extended. Whenever Mickey Mouse was about to retire, Disney's lawyers just lobbied to have it. But I think not the next one's coming up very soon. And like, from what I've heard, there hasn't there hasn't been any. Push. They're not going to contest it this time. Yeah, which would be kind of neat. But again, yeah. it's only for like Steamboat Willie, not for like whatever the latest Mickey Mouse is. And that kind of makes it so like old timey Mickey Mouse will be. You can still use it in parodies even before. Like, South Park did a thing with Mickey Mouse. And it was yeah, really funny. exactly. Yeah, there's the whole, like, comedy parody rules yeah. that you can do. Yeah. Did you ever watch Nathan For You? Like, the parody law stuff? Yeah. It's kind of funny. It's like it's like a, I want to say reality show. It, it's like like an Ali G kind of, mm. where he does these social experiments. But mm. it's, um, he, he, like, masquerades as a business consultant and, like, gives people just horrible ideas for their businesses and it shows them trying these ideas out and just like like i don't know i guess the one they did that got the most attention was something called dumb starbucks where he was like taking advantage of parody law to help like a coffee shop across from a starbucks get the starbucks <laughs> business wow and, you know, it just became this big statement and it was like you know like this you know like people like actually like frequented it and were like buying the merch and <laughs> You know, it's like, it was just the exact Starbucks logo, but I think it just said dumb Starbucks. <laughs> so, I'm sure it wasn't around long enough for the Starbucks and, uh, lawyers to, he, to he jump has, on it. Yeah, he had this whole bit where he was like establishing his credentials as a parody artist. And I think what he did, and, and he had like this independent coffee shop owner that like, like he got like a cease and desist from Starbucks. He's like, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. <laughs> and Nathan's like, I had to go rogue at that point. So he like keeps doing it like in the guy's name without his consent. Wow, wow. And then like he, um, I think he like tried to establish his credentials as a parody artist by like just making this like Banksy looking art exhibit with like different logos that he doctored a little bit. So you'd like, it's like Tank of America instead of Bank of America. And like, people are like, oh wow, this is really political. Like very interesting. <laughs> He's just goofing around. <laughs> Nice. That's kind of fun. That's anyway, fun. Yeah, sorry. it's uh, to totally on, on topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what else? Like, What kind of stuff are you working on these days that you can talk about? Um, I mean, these days it's uh, Four Moms is obviously the um, main focus. Um, so the world is very split between either new product development, continuous improvement. Um, so it's either making sure things are being produced or continually being produced is probably the biggest thing I learned with like mass production. It's just because you make it and kick it off to a production line. It's never just like turnkey and everything works from then on out. It's 
you always get little changes here and there that can turn into uh, issues. You're always watching um, customer care. People are always getting like feedback on stuff or they're finding an issue that maybe because something changed in production for a day. Um, my favorite one is just like they had a, a new assembly worker on the line that did something wrong. Ah, uh, brutal. Yeah, so like we know that that day code has this issue or potential for this issue. So um, you know, we're just always monitoring. So that's a, that's interesting. Do you ever change like uh, like re release a version two of a product or just do different revisions? Yeah. And so sort of there's um, you know what we call like customer level changes, and then there's everything under the hood. We do a lot of under the hood. Okay, that makes you know, sense. You'll learn things like, you know, we'll do testing, we'll find out, oh, you know, maybe this is not performing as well, or the sensor on some units, we're getting a little bit more noise and we're getting customer calls because their unit is throwing an error. So the uh, customer would never know, but you've maybe pushed a firmware update or switched the type of sensor? Correct, yeah, they, they'll yeah. never know. And especially with like supply chains the way they are right now, like I think literally we'll be producing one version of a board for a couple weeks and then we'll switch to another version Brutal. of the board because that microcontroller we have we only have enough to produce a couple of weeks of production and then the next one but we'll you still pump them out that's interesting we still pump them out but do I you have to reserve a certain number of boards for like uh customer service at that point or do you just switch to version no i mean eight? again so because all these changes are not customer facing the customer doesn't know well no but i went if like somebody brings their product in for like a warranty you know like mm -hmm. you know like they have an issue do you, do you keep some of the old stuff in stock? So Only if there's a repair? change we know, like if we know, like sometimes we'll keep like a stock of like, all right, if people have this specific issue, we know that we have a collection of units with this fix. Okay. And then like customer care can pull from that based on some of our like supply chain numberings and things like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's not super common, yeah. but there, there's occasion like we know like if there's a squeak or something, I'm trying to think of a specific case, but like. Yeah, we do have pools occasionally that we, we can pull directly from that if this customer calls and says they have a problem that we know we have a solid fix for. And we That's don't awesome. want to run the chance that the one in a hundred chance they get another unit with that same issue again. Yeah, it's like, okay, we'll just give you one that we know is never going to have that unit. Exactly. For that issue. Yeah. That's cool. But yeah, because, I mean, the, yeah, the continuous improvement is always ongoing. You're always learning stuff and things always change. Um, coincidentally, I think it's like weather changing tends to be the biggest thing. A lot of... A lot of like um, presses in China are open air, so when the temperature changes, your thermal cha uh, cooling rates change. Brutal. So like your cycle times can change a little that, bit. I'm sure that changes your tolerances too. I would think it could change it. Yeah. So yeah. like you have to be kind of cognizant on that. So we'll do like um, first article inspections on parts just to make sure that like any major changes in temperature don't. Can you do work. environmental monitoring to know how to adjust like your your time in the mold or whatever? Yeah. So you can change yeah. the cycle time. You can change the cooling. Uh, some some of our parts are actually made now because they were definitely um, very temperamental. They're now made in environmentally controlled rooms, so yeah. we don't have to worry about that. Um, but occasionally you might find something that you know maybe there's some slightly different parameters in the press and the temperature changes, and that's enough to throw this like bushing just slightly over. Ah. That, like now yeah, now you have a unit that squeaks or something like that. Um, so it's still just always watching. squeaking is annoying. Yeah, yeah. Sense. I mean, and that's probably I bring it just because like that's a common thing because we yeah. hear. People, people have very good sensitivity to sound and we always try to make sure that we uh, improve it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That's interesting, like the kind of stuff you get back from, because it's not my world, so I'm just fascinated by all this. Yeah, so so yeah, that's that's like the continuous improvement. So like anyone who thinks you go to production, life's easy. It's like, no, now you have to have like a team. Who, I've heard it's much harder. It like, is, I, it I, is. Yeah. I, yeah, I actually think like the prototype stuff is great because like, yes, you have five units and you have to fix everything on them and improve them, but like, Continuous production, like it's out of your hands now. You have like no control on what pe someone does with it. Like, yeah, they can take it and you know drop the box. Like you know, you might have a test where you have a drop test for two meters off the ground. Someone goes and drops it three meters, and they're like, "Hey, I got this thing. It's broken." I don't know if they actually dropped it, or like I have my suspicions that maybe they dropped it yeah. beyond what we like to see. Um, but like you have no control on that, and you just don't have to deal with it. And then you have that at scale. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of these. So you just account for X number of, you know, losses due to... Yeah, and like what you got to do is, um, you know, at the beginning when you're developing, you've got to balance. Like you, you can only build a few, you know, dozens or hundreds of these, right? And yeah. Like you find something in your testing of 30 units. Do you decide, like, is that issue something that will scale when you go to production? So there's one in 30 unit, you know, 3% chance. Yeah. Does that going to be a 3% of 100,000 units when you make it? Or is this just oh, a fluke and we just kind of wave it off? And like, and then there's also the cases of like, 
in the field, like you might get those 0.5% situations yeah. that you're never going to find in sample You're never going to find in your sample size of 100 units. You're probably yeah. never going to see it. So, yeah. um, you know, being a company, those things cost money to make those prototypes. Yeah. So, like, you have to find the happy point of, like, all right, we feel like we've tested everything we need to test. I think it's good enough for production. But then as you go to production, yeah, you'll find those one in a hundred thousand, ten thousand, or even a million cases. I, I will say one that we did get pulled into by a company that, that makes produces devices um, for like the prosumer market was kind of interesting is they made this smart device and they were failing anywhere from like a year to three years out in the field. Hmm. Um, and it was it was this uh, it was like the, the board with, you know, like microcontrollers on it and like a display and all sorts of components that was failing. Mm -hmm. But it was random as to when they would fail and which units would mm -hmm. fail. And it was costing like, you know, like seven figures a year, you know, in yeah. RMAs to, you know, due to, due to the losses. And we did a bunch of investigations and we found that the uh, techs on the assembly line were not wearing their ESD wrist straps. Mm -hmm. And so they were discharging electricity into the, yeah. Yeah, but I think like it was like thirty four volts that one of those you know junctions breaks down at, and when you see a physical spark, you're probably discharging like a thousand. Yeah, and so you know it's just a time bomb at that point. And there's some people who like like to think that they can predict all the issues that are going to happen in the field up front. I, I mean, I like to think that's the well, case. Well, that was eye opening for me because I always thought those yeah. wrist straps were for like wimps, you yeah. know, that didn't have the, the courage to I mean, take I a chance. I'm like, no, they're for everybody doing you know anything around sensitive light. I started wearing one after that. <laughs> yeah, and then even then, like, it doesn't stop there. Like, I've been to factories where, yes, everyone's wearing a strap, but then if you actually look at the ground contact, oh, that's not even connected. So it's like they're all, they're just grounded to, to each table. other. Yeah, they're either <laughs> like, yeah, they're all connected to a table. So like, you even have to check further. You know. I feel like that could be worse, right? Like if the table acts like a, would it act like a capacitor in some cases? Or like, yeah, I would think it would build up and yeah. eventually maybe discharge somewhere else. Yeah, and you get like a massive discharge. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the, let me go somewhere else with this. But yeah, I mean, manufacturing is just really cool in yeah. terms of just all the interesting things. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I actually had, um, there was a coworker of ours who was our quality engineer at the time. Yeah. She uh, helped us with... Um, DFMEA, so it's like design failure means an analysis. So like trying to predict failure at like a very systematic level. So oh, like cool. taking a sub-assembly and saying, all right, if this thing was, there's like a whole list of like, can it act, you know, what happens if it, it stopped working? So it, it wasn't working or if it was erratic or uh, periodic, like what's the ramifications of that? And you're, you're trying to go through like every subsystem and every sub-assembly to figure out like what's the things that are wrong. And uh, she went to a conference uh, on this and she met a guy there who was there from some major car company, Toyota or whatever, and uh, they said, he said his company sent them there because they had an issue they found in a car that the DFMA did not come up with. And it was basically that there were ants that were eating the airbag sensors in their Holy vehicles. And just like, how delicious were those airbag sensors? That's what I mean. Like, how do you predict that? Like, yeah. how do you decide? Oh well, let's you know. How do we test the? We got to test the flavor of the airbag <laughs> potting compound to make sure the, the, the local ants of wherever we're selling the vehicle do not eat it. And, and that was a common problem. Like, it, not, it was a big enough problem that they had to like rework a bunch of vehicles, and they sent this guy to this conference to learn more about DFMEA because he did not predict it. In interesting. DFMEA. Why, how the hell would you predict that? That's what I mean. It's just yeah. like, there's, there's, that's why, again, going back to like field, you got to get yeah. out in the field and get things out there. And You're never going to find out about stuff like that. Exactly. Like, I even, I hesitate to think that that guy would be able to predict something like that having gone to that conference. Yeah. And even try yeah. coming up with that in a meeting and not get laughed at. Like, hey, Correct. what about ants? You know, should we put ants on the what list? What are you, high? Get out of here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> Three years later, my God, that guy was brilliant. What's he doing now? Yeah. Turns out well, we fired him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Those wild ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah. I always go back to the, like, NASA, is it faster, better, cheaper? Oh, pick two. Two, two yeah. Yeah. I've, I've put that in decks more than once with customers. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, mean, I, I didn't realize that, that originated with NASA, that's it. I believe that that was the the mindset for um, I think in the two thousands they were trying to push a lot of Mars missions really yeah. quickly so they came up with the faster better cheaper program which was to like launch really cheap Mars mission rovers at a very fast cadence and lost like 
I think even to this day, like the success rate of landing on Mars is like fifty percent or something. Wow. They're getting better in the last few years, but at the time, like they were losing like everything, so they kind of killed that program. Oh, Real so they, they just took the average down. Yeah, I think. I mean, well, I think even like before, probably the last ten years. Was that the when they? Rate. Was that, maybe it was a what was the mission where they had like a unit conversion issue? Yeah, that was that was in the mix of the faster, okay. better, cheaper. <laughs> yeah, That's was, awesome. Yeah, because they had to get it out fast. It was cheap, so if it lost, it wasn't a big deal, and it would be better because they'll get a bunch of these out there. But they just kept losing them. Yeah. That was one of them. I think it, I think it was a like Phoenix lander. They, yeah, they were just that's yeah, wild, burning up units left and right. So, but I mean, that's the thing I bring up in discussions, even at work to this day. It's like, all right, cool. Like, Phoenix is kind of an unfortunate name for something like that. I don't think it's the actual one, but it would be actually yeah. ironic. I think it was the polar polar landers. The one oh, okay. Was the unit conversion. Yeah. Yeah, it, like dive bombs straight into the atmosphere. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Space is so interesting. I've, I've not really spent a whole lot of time working on it directly, but mm -hmm. like I've been in facilities where it's been worked on, like uh, yeah. at, a, at a, yeah, rocket engine components in a few different places. So yeah, that's like the other area that's like on the other side of the spectrum of the world I live in, which is like I live in the world of like fraction of a cent fasteners that you know, <laughs> they fail and not a big deal, and that aer aerospace is the other side where you know, multi hundred dollar, or what thousand dollar fasteners i'm sure that have yeah, to be working and, and every time anytime i think somebody was telling me uh they have an ejector pin device they it was a satellite deploy i think a cubesat deployment system they were working on mm -hmm. um and like the the pin pusher for the mechanism was like six grand yeah <laughs> yeah because they'll, they'll, they'll like break down the, the material they'll probably like x-ray to make sure there's no imperfections in the material yeah. before they machine the but i think it was also just a had mission legacy like it had been used before Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's like, my, my buddy was saying to me, yeah, it's expensive as all, but like, do you really want to take a chance on yeah. your whole mission failing? Because that is, that, I mean, if it's mission critical. Like, yeah. if, if the pin doesn't push out, the satellite doesn't deploy. Yeah, then, I mean, qualification for space. I mean, that's yeah. why they're still running like really old legacy processors on a lot of these like Mars missions and stuff. It's just because yeah. it's, it's been qualified for space and you don't want to take the risk of, you know, your multi-million dollar mission crashing and or spending tens of millions of dollars to qualify some new processor. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, when I was at uh, a certain aerospace company, <laughs> they, they turned their nose up at NASA for using like, you know, 100 base T, I think, instead of like, you know, gigabit ethernet on, right. on the ISS. And, you know, it was, it was interesting to kind of see some of those mentality shift as people interacted more, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really cool to see like what the tech specs are on some of these rovers, and you're like, wow, that's got less processing power than like a Nokia phone. I, I talked recently to um, the CTO from Motive Space, and he's actually going to be on the podcast. Nice. Right? Yeah, uh, Eddie Tunstall, really nice guy, and um, he uh, on their website they have this thing where they they built a robotic arm for a Mars rover that can stand like negative 130 centigrade. I'm like, how the hell did you do that? And he goes, it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It's just, like, testing half that stuff. Like, yeah. it's like, like testing the, was it the Sky Crane for the latest Mars rovers? You know what the Sky Crane is? Is that, like, a helicopter of some kind? It's, so the, the original Mars rovers, um, like, Sojourner, Pathfinder, Pathfinder is the mission, I think. Sojourner is the rover. But, like, yeah. they would come down and they it was would like lead, a like, giant air bag and they would just bounce around. But... The latest generation, yeah, like basically roll. And yeah, that, that was amazing that that's how they, like, as a kid, I remember reading all about that and Wired and just being fascinated. Yeah, I think they have, like, a Matchbox. Matchbox made a version of, like, a little Pathfinder rover. I think I still have it in my house. That's awesome. It was just so cool. But, um, yeah, the original ones were small. Like, Sojourner Pathfinder was, like, the size of a microwave. It was tiny. But the new ones are, like, the size of a Mini Cooper. So, like, you can't just do the, oh, cool. the ball thing anymore because it would just obliterate the ball. So, what you do now is a sky crane. Which is basically this crane system lowers the vehicle from these wires about however many, 20 feet, 30 feet above it, uses rockets to fly, oh, lowers the, the rover, and then just flies off and crashes. But like, like basically developing that, like you don't have Martian gravity. The best you can do to simulate is like scale models, right? Scale models, like, so I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how they actually did it. So they, they can simulate the environment. They have like a giant vacuum chamber in NASA, and then they use oh, cool. a bunch of... Uh, Counterweights and springs that basically simulate Martian. That's gravity, interesting. But like, that's the first thing. It's like, all right, how do we test this? And 
you gotta get, get as close as you can. Get, get the best you can do, and then you yeah. hope it works. Exactly, and then even the rover development, like you don't have Martian soil, so you have to like come up with all these different amalgams. I always thought the planetary robotics set up at, I guess, different building than when you were there, but mm -hmm. I always thought it was interesting, some of the stuff you saw around there. So like, like the Terra mechanics, Thing for testing different wheels where they just roll over dirt over and over and over again. Yeah, when it was Robotics Club in the, the PRV building, there was a guy who was testing this like, I think it was like a six foot diameter inflatable like beach ball, and it was this long, his long, probably 30 foot long by six foot wide trough filled with like silica sand. Oh, interesting. And even though he was jealous, he was like, I don't want you guys playing in there. And we're like, why the fuck were we playing in there? Why were we playing in there? Like, hey, it's like a sand, so like if we make dust, we'll get like silicosis and bad things. Yeah, but, like, horrible. What are we, like two? Like, we're not going to go out there with like sand, like shovels and like pretend it's a beach or something. I think somebody, it might have been like Chuck Whitaker was like, uh, when they installed recently, they put in, hey, recently, seven, eight years ago. They put in a tank in the field robotics center mm -hmm. for like aquatic robot testing. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I don't want people taking midnight swims in here. <laughs> I was like, who the hell is going to do that? Yeah. You know, like, who knows, maybe. Maybe, but like. It's reactionary. Maybe they did have someone playing in there. Well, I, I don't know. I personally, like, I, I've got like a weird, uh, this is maybe a little personal, but like, I kind of feel weird going in like a body of water because like, you know, I might get touched by like part of a mech. This is a tank full of robots. Like, I don't yeah. want to. Take a dip in that. Yeah, the one that touched me on the leg. You yeah, know, like the, yeah, it's I, would, I would freak out like a little schoolgirl. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't want to take a dip in a robot yeah. testing pool. You know, like, I'm sure he's seen people do weird stuff. So. Oh, for sure he has. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did he ever give you that tour, uh, the, the shop safety talk, where he's like, you know, I always warn people about intoxication here, and I've never caught anyone under the influence of drugs or alcohol. But I have repeatedly caught people under the influence of sleep deprivation. Yeah. You know? yeah. A, so that talk was, okay, that's, that's decades in the making. Yep. Yeah. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah, that is. Uh, that is. But then, you know, I, I talked to him about, <laughs> I shouldn't put Chuck Whittaker on blast. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, anyway. I mean, I, I remember, like, being in the um, FRC machine shop doing stuff for projects late in the evening. I know other people have too. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done it many times. I mean, multiple nights in a row sometimes, you know, whatever Red Bull kind of keeps you going through that. You know? Yeah. There was one time I remember distinctly using the lathe. I actually think it's the lathe in the robotics club. It's like two in the morning and I had like, it's like one inch diameter piece of Delrin, six feet long, I put it in, sticking out the back and I was super late. It's like, all right, I'll just cut these off. I need these like Nick bushings or whatever and I'm cutting them. Turn on the machine. And it's like I'm starting. And boom, all this, boom, boom, boom. The, the piece of stock that was sticking out like three feet of the back of the machine kinked at 90 degrees because of the centrifugal force. Yeah, and sense. just started like wailing on the shelf that was right there for all the tooling. So nothing. I think will I know the up. shelf. Yeah, yeah, nothing will wake you up more. The fact that the shelf the survived that because that wasn't damaged when I was in there. Like, yeah, it was a later. big metal shelf, like machine yeah, shelf. It had later. like all yeah. the tooling and stuff, like the yeah. jaws. Yeah. That, that thing took it. Built like a. That, that, that woke me up. I was like, all right, I can't be in here anymore. This is not safe. If, like, I was doing a BattleBots thing like uh, very late at night, I think also 2, 3 a.m. in the Field Robotics Center, and I had this bracket. It was quarter-inch 6061, and I had drilled in a bunch of weight reduction, and it was, um, I think it was like a welded T. So I took like an L joint, and then I had somebody that knew how to TIG weld better than me weld <laughs> another chunk on the side, and then I... I was machining it down to like this bracket for a mechanism on my battle bot. And um, I had it fixtured, like it was gripping like a little quarter inch piece. And I took a big bite with the end mill and just said, boom, <laughs> you know? And, I, and then I, the end mill started biting into it and it pulled it out of the face. And like, oh. I, I don't know if it actually threw it across the room, but it made like these like big chunk marks in it. Where like, Jeez. this this was like a, like a three eighths inch end mill. Or, Sorry, three quarters inch end mill that was running, and it was too fluted because it was aluminum, and so it just it just made like the worst machine marks I've ever seen, and I ruined my part, you know, and I was just like, I'm done, you know, like I'm yeah, that's that's and like no hard. more for tonight, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been in there once or twice when someone launched the lathe key, the chuck key through the air by leaving it in, leaving it in there, on, flipping it on, and then it launches. brutal. <laughs> I've not experienced that yet, just because every shop safety I've been in, they've emphasized that. Yeah. Probably because of people doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think they have keys now. They have like self ejection. They do. On yeah, they've got like a spring, so you can't leave it in. Yeah. And then when that when that uh, student died at Yale because she got her hair cut, I think that woke that. a lot of people up. And there was a weird there was a weird response I think where it was almost like too far the other direction where they had like you know like dead man switches on like every bridge port Jay had and yeah. it was like a little silly and they had like shields that didn't do anything but looked safer to you know the OSHA folks. Yeah, I don't know if Robo Club had it when you were there if it was still around, but. Um, I think it was right around that time frame when the Yale student had that accident and was, um, uh, we did the uh, Tooltron, we yep. called it. Yeah, so we had Tooltron. Okay. Tooltron was still being iterated. When okay, I was yeah, there. it was just like an open project. Like yeah. we, did, we, we set it up, we put all the cards That's in interesting. Everything. I didn't realize that was like a, you know, I mean, that I think, and I think Robo Colony was another one. That Robo was like, Colony was still was, being iterated. That was another I one. I have some colony boards like in a shelf in my yeah. in my shop at home. Those were all like multi generational like yeah. projects that like we started. That's interesting. I did not realize. Yeah, I remember tool, doing the Tooltron stuff, setting that up. Did you guys the the, the walking robot? Sorry, I don't mean to. That. No. Let's talk about Tooltron first. No. Yeah. no, but like yeah, Tooltron like just setting it up and um, we thought it was a little overkill, but it actually was good because there was actually people using the tools that shouldn't have been using them at all. So you just, it was, not, it was an authorization system. It was just, yeah, yeah you just take your CMU ID, you swipe it through, and it would just check a whitelist. So like, all right, they, and turn it on. I wonder why they kept iterating that, because it sounds like that works great the way you're describing it. Like, why did they have to change There was that? little things we had to figure out, too. Like, every time we had a discussion, like, all right, so how long does the machine stay on? Like, it has to be on long enough to use your thing, but oh, like, you don't want it to kick off in the middle of your work. Yeah. Well, when I was there, they had RFIDs, so you could leave it in a little tray. Oh, too. really? Okay. So they got it's right. Not, yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, but uh, I think at one point, like, the RI reached out because they wanted to use Tooltron, but I don't think it went anywhere. And I I've not seen that in the field robotics. Center. Yeah, I don't think it... it They're it probably concerned about downtime, like, if it gets screwed up and, you know... Not that's what I was saying. Someone's going to manage it and everything. And yeah. I think the, um, the coolest thing, though, is they, uh, there was at one point after that accident, the um, CME was going around to, like, all the student shops, and they are like, all right, you know... We want to take a, an audit of what tools you have and everything. They did that in my time, too. They did that, okay. It, it actually might have been your time. It was actually after. Yeah. Right? I just remember seeing it on the, um, the Roblox Club, like, officers list. Well, and, and now there's, like, no shops left. There's no so student shops. shut them all down. But the Robotics Club, because I remember, like, emailing them. I was like, hey, hey someone to fight for you. Like, I'm here, and I actually did write a letter. Did they get to keep it? They got to keep it, yeah. No, that's awesome. It. In fact, um, they, what they were saying is for any of the remaining shops, what they wanted to do is upgrade any of the van, uh, any of the table saws. To yeah, saw we got stop. a saw stop. So I think RoboClub didn't have a saw stop, but they went out and bought like a cheap like twenty dollar crappy table saw from yeah. like Craigslist. And sure. Like, oh, hey, we have a table saw. We should get a nice new. <laughs> and then they they gave them a nice like fifteen hundred two thousand dollar like saw stop to use in the, the club. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that thing was sweet. It, it definitely rips. Yeah, I, I have one at home, and it's, yeah, I mean, just the price of my fingers in ta being intact is really nice. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I still use the Craigslist uh, <laughs> Deluxe. <laughs> so, haven't put a finger through it yet, but, I mean, it would only take, what, 500 milliseconds or left, less yeah, to lose I've, one? Yeah, I've been hit by a kickback. That was fun. But, yeah. I've had that happen. I had a kickback, so I was feeding from eye level one time, and I had a kickback push, I think it was a piece of Delrin, like, into my, I was wearing one of the full face shields mm. and it knocked the face insert out of the shield. Wow. And that was terrifying. Yeah, yeah that was like a whoa. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was like, I'm done. I'm done for the day. Yeah, I was cutting a two by four yeah. cross cut. And this is like the first time I was using a table saw because I always found them terrifying. You know, they still are, which is yeah. probably a good mindset to have with table saws. But I was doing a cross yeah, cut, I but so. I had this, the, the, the fence right there between yeah. the blade. So I was cross cutting and it just got a piece that got cut off, canted. Uh, shot back, nailed me in the shoulder. Brutal. And you get a bruise? That, yeah, I got a big yeah. bruise, cut there. I was lucky it didn't hit my face or anything, but that would give me the, the big respect about you know, yeah. kickback. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. How would you even prevent that? Just pushing harder against the stop and like more parallel? Well, you have no fence usually. Yeah. You do, and now I know, but like, yeah, you, when you do a cross cut, you don't use a fence because that's basically what's causing it. Is it, it gets twisted and then it's got nowhere to go but the direction the blade's spinning. So. You remove the fence and then use a crosscut sled, oh, which is just like a, a singular wall that the blade can go through the center. So when yeah. you cut it, the piece that you cut, rather than hitting anything, it just kind of falls off to the side of the Yeah, it makes sense. Blade. Interesting. When you say crosscut, you mean cutting it that way? And yeah, cut cutting, cutting the fibers versus like along the fiber. Got it. Yeah. Did not know that. Thank you. Closet, <laughs> closet woodworker. Yeah, no, you, might, you might have just saved me from a horrible injury. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, if you're cutting crosscut, just think. 
think it through. <laughs> yeah, usually I use the fence for cutting plastic. So I, I run yeah. a laser cutter in my shop at home, and I am a cheap bastard, so I'll buy like big sheets of plastic from yeah. the master and cut them down on the, the table saw. That's why I got it, was just to cut down plastic for the laser. Yeah, and I think the only way to get kicked back with that is um, also making sure I think the part is longer than it is wide, is the other rule of thumb. You don't want to cut like something that's more square because it can still cant and shoot back at you. And then, uh, yeah, just making sure that you have like a writhing knife or something behind the blade so the back side of the blade doesn't pick up your part and launch it at your face. So that's like the little things that dig in to... Yeah, the writhing knife is just like, a, it looks like a little like shark fin that goes on yeah. the back side of the blade. Just so I've sure got those like, in mind. Yeah, just make sure those are always there because yeah. that's the other form of kickback is that the blade lifts up the other side of your material and launches it at your face. That it makes a lot of sense. Enough. And I don't know that I really trust the writhing knives on mine because they're just like little spring-loaded dinky things that... Mm. I guess they've been there since... Like, I think mine's like a 1970s, you know, like Rockwell. There's probably people that use normal ta yeah. uh, table saws that are not saw saws. Yeah. Well, what I mean is it's like kind of impressive that a consumer product has lasted that many decades. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, again, that lays in robotics gloves. Yep. But that's not a consumer product. That's It's not a consumer product, yeah. but I mean, even then, like... Yeah, good point. Some of, some of the older tools are really, like, really great. I'm trying to think. My, I just gave away a, a drill press from, like, the 1960s that had this giant casting. I was just going to say, yeah. my, my drill press is actually one that Red Zone got rid of, and I think it was from 1960s. And that's it's awesome. And giant cast base, and I think I had to fix... It was making like a rattle noise and I just had to fix the, the pulley on it and it had like a, a bad keyway or something so I replaced the key. And nice. You know, I have a really nice drill press. Yeah, those things are awesome. Like they're never going anywhere. Exactly, yeah. I think mine was a Craftsman I got on Craigslist oh, yeah. for like a hundred bucks. Old Craftsman and Old Deltas are actually really, yeah. really good for like band saws, drill presses and things like that. Yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah. Bridgeport J-Head not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's my, actually, it's one of my shirts. Yeah, I noticed that. Home of Bridgeport 001. So there's a... Uh, Last year, I was on a vacation to Vermont. There's a museum in Windsor, Vermont, called the American Precision Museum. Oh, cool. Which is, like, all, like, old, um, not old, but, like, machining equipment. And they have the very first Bridgeport knee mill. Nice. Serial number 001, so I got that. But, like, looking at the picture of it, it looks like the ones that they've kept making. Like yeah, it, it is the one that's basically the same that they make now. So they just didn't change the design a whole lot. No, it was, that. like, one of the first with that design, and they're, like, super popular. But uh, it was pretty cool. It's a tiny museum, tiny building. You go in, they, they give you a little movie to watch, and they, they position as Windsor as, like, the... Um, uh, Silicon Valley of the 18, late 1800s. <laughs> that's so it's all funny. mechanical machining and stuff. And uh, you go through, and it's like all these old like Swiss, um, either like Swi Swiss screw making machines. I've things. heard good things about those. Yeah, like you feed in rod stock and screws come out. Like it's that's awesome. this is all made. In well, the it's 1800s. like it's, I mean, it's like programmable, right? So you can well, keep in mind. Yeah, this is like 1800s yeah. though. Like programmable means like you move cams and stuff. Yeah, and, like, but, yeah. yeah, it's all that, and it was really cool because. Uh, the director of the museum, I guess they don't get a lot of engineers, which is weird. Cause for what you would is. think it he would be running down mecca for engineers. Yeah, like uh, that's what I thought. I was like, hey, you really don't get a lot of engineers. Uh, but he like he came down and he was just like showing me like all the stuff and like talking about it and he was showing me like a a, a a mechanical bullet speed chronograph. How does that work? So it actually uses like an explosive charge. So like when the bullet passes through one area, it, it hits something that shorts basically a charge and you're able to figure out like it leaves these marks on these lines so they can figure out like how much the bullet has dropped between the two points oh and interesting they can, so they can actually figure out the height against the acceleration due to gravity right into the time and then the duration and they could calculate kind of muzzle velocity off of that that's pretty cool and it was really cool they, they probably had, had to actually, put them pretty far apart though i would think with these things were only a couple feet but like it had very like they it would need these like very fine lines on it and I think oh, okay. take and compare them so they can get down to like that's pretty cool things. that you could get that level of precision with that that distance and those with that level that you know eighteen hundred yeah. and it, was, it had like a bat a, a battery on it because it was electric and it was like an old like dry cell like wrapped up um, oh, like one of those glass dealies yeah it, it almost looked like a, a linden jar kind of that's deal. cool it was like glass and it was really cool like they had all sorts of stuff and like in the middle they do um, they had like a modern like Haas. CNC to show like where machining yeah. has gone, which is like the lowest end CNC machine you can get these days. Yeah, it, it was like the small one, but, but it's yeah. still probably like a hundred grand machine or something. Yeah, that sounds yeah. about right for yeah. us. But it was cool. Like they, you start with like um, the original uh, broaching machines that put like the, the the line the spiral broaches inside mobiles that they use in like the seventeen hundreds. Oh, cool. And things like that, and then you kind of go through the years and screw machines and stuff like that. That's awesome. But, 
Yeah. I thought this was a really nerdy shirt. But yeah, I thought most I, people I like that you yeah. wore that. <laughs> I was going to comment, but just, you know, we're talking about so many other things with all the common threads we've been finding. So it just did, didn't come up yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. One of my friends, uh, I've had him on the podcast, Earl Eisen, um, and I've talked about this before, so sorry if you've heard it, but he's, um, he's doing production runs of like these little aluminum and titanium buckles for mm. the adventure sport market. And he's kind of gotten me nerding out over a lot of engineering history. And so there's a book he showed me, Freedom's Forge, where it's mm. about um, production during World War II, and like it, it gets into, um, like um, I think Knudsen was the guy that was like, he was like the... I want to say the president of GM, but maybe some other high level executive there. And, um, you know, they were like, I don't know, he was like a salesperson, I think. And I don't know if he was an engineer, but um, he became like a production expert. And then, like, like, they made him a general during the war, and he would go around and, like, inspect these different plants and right. try to come up with things that could go wrong to slow down national production. And then they would get the automotive industry involved in like shipbuilding and like um, aircraft building. And they invented these like overhead pulley systems for like mm. aircraft parts in those factories. And, you know, they were making like mile, multi mile long factories, like just crazy scale. Um, the B 52 was apparently a huge, not sorry, the B 29 was apparently a huge challenge mm. because it was like very complex uh, mechatronically. And so there were just a million things to go wrong, and they had like the ailerons wired backward at one point in like one of the early prototypes. Did you ever see the like what a wiring harness for like a helicopter looks like? No, I, I really Sounds recommend googling that because um, yeah, I saw that recently. Like I was like for a Sikorsky hel helicopter, what they do is they actually have a giant board with a bunch of like nails and pins, and oh, they run cool. the wires, and then they they bound them up, and you just see that it looks like 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 a nervous system. I've seen that done on a rocket. Mm. It's probably similar. I'm guessing yeah. it's all aerospace stuff, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's neat. Yeah, I didn't realize they did that for helicopters, too. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever uh, been around, like, composites at all? I have not. Um, we dabbled a little, or looked at it a little bit in the like, four months or something, but it's not at the Gets cost pretty. effectiveness <laughs> for, for the world I live in. That makes sense. But, yeah. I've done it at like the like the single unit quantity for like stuff you know years ago mm -hmm. with like some of the CMU affiliations. I uh, made a custom uh, robotic boat for like looking at the aftermath of the BP oil spill, mm. and so uh, that was interesting. We started with eighth inch plywood and did a layup over the top of it, mm. and so it was um, it was actually me and Uriel and another buddy of ours and like some other people as well, and. Um, we, I guess what you do is you come up with your basic shape in wood and you try to get it as thin as possible because it all adds weight and the whole right. point is to reduce weight. And then for the hulls of the boat, it was these 10 foot hulls because you don't have to license it if it's less than 10 feet. Ah, so yeah. we just did it at 10 <laughs> feet. Um, and then we had these stainless steel drive systems where they protrude from the bottom of the boat. And then it's at like an angle whereby the motor never gets submerged, but you can flood the whole drive shaft. Mm -hmm. um, then we had, I think it was stainless shafts uh, ceramic bearings and then an aluminum exterior um, and there was a shear pin so that if it gets caught on something it just free spins mm -hmm. uh, client later replaced that with all thread and ended up losing a prop as a result they got caught on some kelp um, but uh, the, the way we did it was we, we built it out of wood first um, mm -hmm. that was like a pretty awesome design then we painted it with um, we're all wearing like dual cartridge 3M respirators mm -hmm. painted it with um, like epoxy laid down two layers of fiberglass i think it was two layers it might have been one layer for the tensile strength on the main hull and then the uh keels got covered in kevlar so that it would have abrasion resistance mm. if you drag it up on rocks or sand um and then the whole thing got painted with an epoxy top coat uh and just to make it look all right so you just like your form is um like you're doing on the outside of the form yeah exactly okay. and then the form just becomes integral to the, to cool. the hull so that was that was my, my main composite. I, I had one before that in the CMU Box Club where it kind of ended up resembling like a cat scratching post. I can't remember <laughs> what the application was. But we were like making some robot and trying to make it out of fiberglass. And it's, it's really easy to have it bunch up and get all crappy, especially in the compound curves. And yeah, exactly. Like yeah. And it's, it's difficult to get those right. So, I mean, with the, with the boat haul, it was, I was lucky enough to work with people that had more composites experience than me. And so they knew to kind of make make everything wet and spend lots of time 
pushing it down, and I think you sand between layers, which is, you get lots of dust, which mm -hmm. that's why you want the respirators, among other reasons, but the, the epoxy uh, that hasn't cured yet. And then, um, yeah, it's just a lot of attention. I think some people will vacuum bag to like- I was gonna stuff. ask if you ended up vacuum bag. We I, didn't, I think I but, remember hearing that for like carbon fiber, you need to do it more, but- Yeah. For like yeah. Bolt, boat holes, I haven't heard people back, vacuum bagging. Yeah, we didn't do it, but I, I heard stories about it. <laughs> I think if you're really trying to get like all the resin out and really control weight, I think that's what you use the vacuum bag That makes a lot of sense to me. Pretty much everything else. I'm, I'm a cooking nerd, so when I when I sous vide something to marinate, you can use less marinade and back bag it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's, uh, I, um, I'll do ribs that way when I don't have access to an outdoor grill. Mm. So you can, you can vacuum bag liquid smoke. Like mustard powder and, and paprika and uh, like maybe coriander, um, brown sugar and like a little cayenne and it's good. You end up getting really is good. Susie even let you. Is it cook faster? or Is it just because it's no. cook at a lower temperature? A uh, lower temperature. Okay. So like if you look at like a USDA pasteurization curve, it's all about like you don't actually have to hit one sixty five Fahrenheit on the inside, mm -hmm. but like you can hold like one thirty for like a long enough time okay. and have. A similar food safety result. Gotcha. So different proteins break down at different temperatures. So if you hold a lower temp, you can get a different uh, texture of food. Uh, so nice. That's interesting stuff you can do. It's. I went through a phase where when I first learned about it, I was sous vide everything. <laughs> and as I, I, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't. Like I, a steak, I don't think is ever going to be better. Well, maybe sometimes. It'll be more consistent. Mm -hmm. Like I think Chipotle sous vides their steak because like any schmuck can get it right. You know, right. you don't need to be good at turning and burning to you just you know it's forgiving you can right. put plus minus it's 30 minutes yeah. They're going for, yeah yeah exactly um but like i prefer the the flavor of like a steak that's like actually raw on the inside so mm -hmm. i don't do it for that anymore uh fish i don't really think is great that way uh although it can be it just depends what you're making i really like it for like uh like pork like ribs and like anything you'd slow cook like i feel like it's it's great for that and so nice. yeah yeah. And then I've been doing uh, smoked or cured gravlax lately, so like cured salmon. Mm. So like um, you just vacuum bag it with like brown sugar and salt and mm. coriander and a little bit of dill, and uh, it's it's really good. You can you can make delicious gravlax nice. at home with a vacuum sealer. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I like to cook, but I, I think I've been more into the like growing and harvesting side of food right That's now. That's cool. Yeah. So what are you growing? Uh, so this year we extended our garden, so we have a lot of tomato. I did potatoes for the first time, which actually was pretty cool. Nice. I've uh, never done potatoes. They're actually really easy. Yeah. Um, I just okay. literally just harvested like 21 pounds of potatoes the other day. That's awesome. Yeah. It was just a five-gallon bucket, a bunch of five-gallon buckets. How long do you have to eat those before you, know, you got to... So that'll be the question. That'll be my first year <laughs> of preserving. Uh, so we're eating what we can. What my YouTube education has told me is that if I do it right, I can probably preserve them for several months. Nice. However, I'm not super confident I'll get it right. But, How do you uh, preserve potatoes? So a lot of it is, the ideal conditions for a potato is cold, dark, and humid. Interesting. The coldest I can get in my basement is like 65, 70 degrees. So I don't think I'm gonna be cold enough, but I'm hoping I can just prolong it enough until we So they just it. like still a little bit alive then if you do like I would Yeah, if die. they if they get too warm or too dry, they'll try to sprout. Oh I see. So you'll get the eyes and they'll try to shoot up, you know, plants to try to become a plant. So Yeah, it makes sense. So it's now or never. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's exactly what it is. It's it's yeah. just figures out like, all right, I'm gonna die, so I gotta try. Um, yeah. so we'll see. So we got 20-ish, a little under 20 pounds now of potatoes, so we'll see what we get from there. But it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, food preservation stuff has actually been really interesting. It's been like the other side hobby. I've got so many stupid, not stupid, but fun hobbies on the side. Yeah, well, that's what, I mean, that's what curing salmon is, is food preservation. Yeah, food preservation. So like canning is probably yeah. the big one I've been doing a lot the last few years. So like, it just boggles my mind that you can like take something that you grew, throw it in the jar under the right conditions, and it will be there for like two, three years. Like, that's pretty incredible. Just, yeah, it's like... I thought this was the magic you can only get at like the supermarket, but like, yeah, no, you can actually- Turns out they house. do that because they're people too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, brining is the new one I'm doing, so I'm doing like brines and ferments. Interesting. So. I didn't know nothing about fermentation. We used to make beer in undergrad. That's, mm -hmm. that's all I really know about it. Yeah, uh, was it, uh, kombucha was actually one I nice. dabbled in for a while. Um, ferments, just gonna be doing like um, hot sauces. 
Nice. Kind of what I'm looking at. So I have a whole bunch of peppers that are coming in various spice levels. So I'm what kind of what kind of peppers are you growing? Uh, I have a bunch of poblano peppers right now. Sweet. Um, I have one called a habanado, which looks like a habanero, but it's not spicy. Interesting. So uh, they're kind of neat. They're they're kind of sweet. So uh, I'm gonna try mixing and matching a bunch. And that sounds good. Ferment them and try to create some hot sauce. See how they turn out. Yeah. I don't know. My cousin's growing pineapple tomatillos right now. Okay. Yeah. Good. Those are cool. Yeah. Those, are, those are delicious. I've definitely been in this garden and just you know eaten half the plant. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> like, I go out there and we have a whole bunch of um, like snap peas and it's just, snap peas are great. I do those. Just when sit I was there like, topping them as I'm like weeding and everything. And it's yeah, just those awesome. are super delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, squash is probably the other big one we have a lot of. So. Squash is really good. Uh, summer squash, winter squash. Uh, I actually did winter squash for the first time. Yeah, so that's my most, mostly summer squash. So zucchini and patty pan squash, which is actually really neat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did uh, honey or butternut squash. I love butternut so much. I did that for the first time. It was just like, oh, let's just throw it out there. I threw like two seeds in the ground, and um, these things, uh, I guess, they're vining, so they actually, like, we have like raised beds, so they actually like crawled out. They're about, oh, like cool. eight or ten feet beyond the, the raised bed, but they're like spitting off butternut squashes everywhere. That's awesome. So I think I just two seeds. Them. Yeah, like two seeds. All it takes is one. Yeah. I think I have like five pounds. So. Wow. Eng- engineering nerd me is like actually keeping a log as much as I can of everything we harvest and like yeah. comparing it to like. Giant eagle prices to see like, oh, like uh, I think it made like well, three hundred bucks so far. I've been doing that with the grav locks. I, uh-huh. I haven't I haven't spreadsheeted my overall savings, but I, you can get it from Costco for like I want to say it's like ten bucks a pound or so, like yeah. plus or minus three. And um, you know if you get like salmon from there, and so I don't know, it's like what you pay like fourteen bucks for a twelve ounce, you know, whatever or something yeah. or. Sometimes more than that, you know, and so I was just Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. that was the big thing. I'm trying to remember the high price. It tastes Herb, better. Herbs are actually the big thing. I think I'm going to actually do more next year. Because... I had an indoor herb garden, uh, I want to say like three years ago, mm-hmm. where I, I just wanted to do it as like an automation project. And so I had it set up where there were lights. I think it was 12 hours on, 12 hours off, but I might be wrong. It might have been 16 and 8. I can't remember exactly what it was, but... I had lights turning off and on on timers, and then I had water turning off and on on timers going through like a reverse osmosis filter. Mm -hmm. And then I had these little nozzles that would just water these plants inside a cabinet, Um, you know, and and what I loved about it is I could get really busy at work and leave it alone for like three weeks, you know, because I just didn't have time for it and come back and it would just be overgrown. Uh, The only thing that was a bit of an issue is I was growing basil and it would pollinate, or not maybe, it would, uh, the flowers would Flower, grow, yeah. and you know, then you just ruin the, the yield. I did a whole bunch of basil this year, and I just didn't keep on top of it, and it flowered like crazy, and I was just like, whatever. Yeah. This isn't <laughs> edible anymore. Yeah, that, that's actually the biggest thing, is just trying to automate what I can. So, yeah, well, that's uh, fun. I mean, I, I enjoy doing that. Yeah, that's why I have an automatic watering device now for the, the main garden, using like drip irrigation and everything, which is so nice, because I don't have to go out there and water constantly. Nice, yeah, that's basically what I was doing. Yeah. And then it, um, it kind of got a little bit out of hand, so I was, um, I was trying to do meat curing and, and set up like a dual zone climate control system so I could have multiple experiments running. Mm. And I, I spent like five or six grand <laughs> and just never, like I, I had a relationship end, <laughs> I think partly as a result of that project and the amount of time it took, you know, and so. I, I just I just had to put that one on the shelf. Like I, I you know, I was like, yeah, I probably. I've had someone point that out. It's like, you know, you can just go to the store and get tomato salt. You're like, you don't have to grow the tomato can. It. It's like, yes, I can, but there's you know, satisfaction. There's satisfaction. You know where it came from. Yeah. You know, you can change it to make it whatever flavor or whatever you want. You tailor it to your need. Yeah, yeah. I can go get a two dollar can of tomato sauce. Yes, you're right. But yeah. I, what? I, I made engineering mistakes on that. Uh, you know curing automation setup too because mm. I was trying to this is stupid but I was trying to get it like as close to like a clean room environment as I could so I, I had a HEPA filter I bought on eBay on the cheap that was like for like building remediation and then that was meant to be the intake for like fresh air exchange and then I had two inline ducting fans that were like I can't remember even the off the top of my head I think it was like there was an outlet and then I think it was pulling air back off a Y to the outlet and recirculating mm. it and then I was trying to build pressure static controls in so it could control all the fan motors. And it just got ridiculous. And, um, you know, as a result, like, you know, it just didn't get finished. Because I bit off, like, more than a reasonable amount I was, I was for a hobby project. Point, I was going to try to get into, like, hydroponics. I, like, spec'd nice. out everything, designed everything. And then I was, like, doing the cost. It was, like... It's smart that you didn't start buying stuff until you had it designed. Yeah, I mean, that's, than... that's a little bit of, like, my, like, 
sometimes I'll suffer on a project like the, the analysis paralysis. I'll like try to analyze everything I can and I'll do the spreadsheets, the cost as much as I can and then kind of look at the ROI on it. it like, I feel like oh. I'm like that with picking out a new car right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, same thing. Like spreadsheets of like all the dealers, what they're offering. And, yeah. It's just the engineered mindset that's and pervasive just, in everything in my life. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Or like, I don't know. I don't know if it's like pure analysis paralysis. I think it's just like I'm on the fence with a few different cars. I yeah, like. I don't say like necessarily like total paralysis but I'm I'll holding out for like some the perfect one which analytics. doesn't exist yeah. yeah just to make sure like all right is it worth it or like all right obviously I'm not going to get like a financial return on it am I enjoying it enough to cover that yeah path? that's like, it that's that's what I'm really looking so, for like I, I I test drove like a used uh, Lexus LS460 which if you don't know it's like basically a limousine mm. and so uh, they were they were seventy thousand dollars when they came out uh, but you can get one that's like you know like 10 years old for like uh, like 20 25 yeah and so I, I was looking at those and I, I test drove one and it's got a 4.6 liter v light so i'm like it'll be sporty it's got all wheel drive not sporty at all <laughs> like the transmission it's kind of soggy <laughs> so you put your foot down and it's like <laughs> like it like, takes a second for it to like figure out what you're trying to do and so that i was like yeah i don't know if i want to drive because it's also gonna be horrible on gas because it's got this giant v8 so i'm like eh. Yeah, but if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. I have one coworker who's like over the year, every like three or four years, he gets a new car, but like he sells the one car, uses the proceeds of that to buy the next one. So he's gone from like a, um, I think he had like a, a MG, then he got nice. a Miata, and now I think he's I was actually, thinking about a Miata. How was that to drive in Pittsburgh? He loved it. I think he had it for a couple of years. He, did he was able to use it in the winter and not in No, he, he, um, he stores it in a garage. Oh, that makes more sense. It's yeah. a spring car, but it's, you know, it's a fun car. And yeah. then he, uh, I think he just sold the Miata and I think he just got like a Porsche, like an older nice. 2000, early 2000s Porsche. But yeah. like, yeah, he just takes it. It's not for any financial return. He puts a little bit extra in it. Although I think he got a lot back on the Miata just because of the whole inflation spike of vehicles. That's pretty awesome. So that's how he got the Porsche pretty well. I was so. partying out robots and stuff just because yeah. you know, <laughs> like that weren't in use. That you know normally it wouldn't be worth it, but yeah. parts were up. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's all about you know RO, your emotional ROI, return on investment for your. Happiness Does it make state. me happy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like a Miata would put a smile on anyone's face. Yeah, so. yeah they're, they're interesting though. A neighbor yeah. of mine had one down the street. He was always very high. Bright yellow one. I don't think it would work as a primary car in Pittsburgh. I think it would have to be your secondary. Yeah, it's got to be like a fun car. You can yeah. Take around. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, not a commuter car. Well, it's also just the winter, I think, would. would yeah. Oh, yeah. It's I mean, not you, safe at all. Yeah, like in the potholes, winter. Potholes, you would swallow that thing. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, like going to get groceries and like, ah, I got no real estate. Yeah, exactly. You get like <laughs> go one to Costco. Hat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I got to return half the stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, I, know, I feel like we're uh, we're probably at a good kind of sort of stopping point. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting mix of all, all things everywhere, robotics. This is, I mean, we, if you want to do this again, I would I would love to have you on another time. Yeah, let me know. Really, really fun. Yeah. Is there anything you want to plug while we're, while we're still here? No, nothing, nothing specific. Just enjoying everything. Um, Give money to the CMU Robotics Club. CMU Robotics Club always looking for a uh, donation. Um, for moms, check out our products. Buy a Mamaru. Buy a Mamaru. Buy, Buy two. Yeah, yeah. You know people. You need, uh, you're having kids or you know, need products, favorite products, check out For Moms. Oh, sweet. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Spencer. Yeah.